To those of you who are joining us online, we can see you in the comments. We are just waiting for colleagues to join us in the building as well as online, and then we will get started with the program of the day. Thank you. Thank you, but there's no sound. There's no sound on Teams. Good morning, good morning, colleagues. Good morning, good morning, good morning, colleagues online. We're trying to attend the sounds at the venue so that it means uh, the colleagues online. We appreciate, we appreciate uh, Dr. Mbiza. Thank you very much. Thank you. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Good. Good. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Just there. Testing, testing. Can everybody hear me on Teams? Is the sound audible? Good morning, good morning. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Is the sound working? But the program is going to start. Thank you. 
Testing, testing, one, two, three. 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 Sorry. Good morning, colleagues from Teams. Can you confirm that we have sound on your side? Can you please confirm? We can write a message, we can raise it away. I think the sound is up now. Sanbonani, Dumelang, Absheni, Khuyamora, good morning. My name is Dr. Togazane Giosini, and I will be serving as your program director for today. I'd like to acknowledge in absentia our Vice Chancellor, Professor Lenkambula, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Meiwa, Acting Dean in Sedu, Professor Magwe, Deputy Dean, Professor Mabunda, School Directors, Professor Dabane and Professor Seroto, Head of Graduate Studies and Research, Professor Gaza, Managers and CODs, Researchers, Academic and Supporting Staff, Distinguished Guests, all joining us both in the building and online, all protocol observed. For the next two days, the SEDU Young Academics Under 40 will be serving as the program directors, moderators, as well as panelists, along other colleagues. It is a heartwarming experience to be part of SEDU, where we are being given the opportunities to grow and learn, as well as thriving in different areas of expertise. 
As the Young Academics Research Interest Group, we are standing on the shoulder of giants who have come before us. And as mentioned by Professor Lenka Mula on Monday at the official opening of the Research and Innovation Week, UNISA is committed to ensuring that it invests in research. It is my honor and my privilege to introduce Professor Veli Siwegaza, who serves as the Head of Graduate Studies and Research. She will do the official opening and welcome this morning. Over to you, Prof. May we please give her a warm round of applause. My dear colleagues and distinguished guests, good morning. And uh, thank you for gracing us with your presence in person or virtually. The Research and Innovation Week forms part of the festivities to highlight research efforts in our university. This is an annual event and we are proud in our college that we haven't break this tradition since its inception. Research and Innovation Week aims to provide UNISA researchers with a platform for cross, trans, inter, and multidisciplinary engagements, collaborations, partnerships, networking, and showcasing of the various research activities and flagship, as well as recognizing and celebrating those researchers who have excelled in research. We are always looking forward to this day, thinking of the topical issues that needs to be debated, thinking of innovation, innovative solutions that need to be shared, and thinking of cautious measures that need to be taken. When I'm talking about solutions, I'm reminded of great scholars of yesteryears who were solution-oriented. Many a times, we researchers have drifted into a tendency to find problems rather than solutions. We go to different parts of our country or continent to engage with our communities and come back with more problems without solutions. We then make same recommendations that were recommended 20 years ago. We don't bother engage, to engage those communities in order to know why those recommendations never worked. I am happy that one of today's panel discussions discourse focuses on this. Ladies and gentlemen, we have put together a very interesting program where we will first do the launch followed by panel discussions. We have two panel discussions whereby the first panel discusses the topic um, research impact juggling between academic and real world impact. The issue of research impact is always hanging on our shoulders and we cannot afford not to discuss it. The second panel discusses the topic being an emerging or developing researcher in the artificial intelligence age. The issue of AI has dominated academia recently and proven researchers have debated and took their stance on it. However, Emerging or developing researchers have not been given an opportunity to, to debate it. Hence, today we will hear from them. Before getting to the next session, let me appreciate our external distinguished scholars who graciously agreed to form part of our first panel discussion. It's Professor Yasmin Atahi, University of Southeastern Norway. Professor Sarah Banzilal, University of KwaZulu Natal. Professor Tony Essin, University of the Vedveda Strand. Uh, Professor Aslam Fata from the University of Stellenbosch. Dr. Najwa Norodin, Cape Peninsula University of Technology. Professor Gagoma Luneta from University of Johannesburg. And Professor Robert Q. Berry III. Uh, from University of Arizona. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before I turn back uh, to the session chair, let me wish you a delightful and stimulating day. Thank you.
Thank you for that warm opening and welcome. We are now going into the launch of the SEDU Young Academics Research Interest Group. It's a very exciting time in the college, and I'd like to ask Professor Gaza to come and start our launch off before our colleagues join us on stage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is an exciting day whereby our young academics are given wings to fly. This is an interest group of academics who are under the age of 40 that started in March 2023. I am amazed by the passion and commitment that these young academics have shown in a short space of time. This is a much needed forum that aims at giving our young academics a platform to excel, network, share their ideas, and get support from each other. This is their corner, and their corner is written, no adults allowed. Uh, this means we will support them at a distance. It is our wish that this forum will captivate your aspirations and increase your visibility in research. As this forum is aimed at being developmental in nature, it must ensure that you spread your wings and not be contained in a cocoon. I know of academics who have come and left this institution without leaving their mark. Very few new that uh, they ever existed in this institution because they were working in silos. They were not involved or visible in seminars, in conferences, in meetings, and in academic gatherings. I hope you are aware that academia is a competitive field. You must learn the ways of self-promoting yourself. Don't wait for your mentor to do that for you. You are the one responsible for building your brand in order, in order to open up a new world of opportunity for yourself. The whole college is behind you. So claim your existence and take over. Thank you. Without further ado, I invite the SEDU Young Academics Interest Group to please join us on stage. Carry and go. <laughs> <In> our corner. <laughs> no, and no, that's allowed. No, go <laughs> <laughs> no, goes here. <laughs> I thought we said we're not all supposed to be. Well, same. Well, same. Well, same. Well, what happened to us not coming all here on things? Guys, we are live. We are live. We are live. Oh, you're going to have to I think that's the finding. So we need us. Yeah. So it's not going to finish it No. You'll release us after introducing the thing. Okay. The mic. Um, he's not playing this game. Yeah. <laughs> Can you get the slide up? We're not going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. 
Is he going to play with lights? Can you have the slides on? <laughs> Can we get the slides? All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks to Professor Gaza for a warm welcome and an introduction to this young academic research interest group. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce to you an exciting new init initiative within our college, which is called the Young Academic Res Research Interest Group, AKA YARES. That will be our hashtag. This group is dynamic and vibrant community of young researchers who are passionate about advancing knowledge and making meaningful contribution into our fields. The Young Academic Research Interest Group has been established with the aim of providing platform for young scholars within the College of Education in order to engage in research, collaborate with peers, and foster culture of intellectual curiosity and academic growth. We believe that research plays a vital role in shaping future of education. This group aims to create an environment that nurtures the research interest of our young academics. Our group is dedicated Right. Our group is dedicated in fostering support and collaborative research community where members exchange ideas, receive feedback on their, on their work, develop their research skills through regular meetings, workshops, events, and meetings. Uh, we strive to provide opportunities for young researchers to network with each other, share their research findings, and explore potential in order to collaborate. Furthermore, Yarek, as I've indicated, is committed to promote research dissemination and engagement beyond our college. We aim to organize seminars, conferences, and symposiums where members can present their research to a wider audience, gain valuable insight, and contribute to the scholarly dialogue in the field of education and other fields. Therefore, as you can see here next to me, I've invited all our young academics within our college. We had the passion for research to who have joined this uh, group called Yarek. Whether you are the beginning researcher in a journey like myself, like, or already embarked on an exciting project like our chair, which Dr. Mulo, or Dr. Nguana, to mention few who are in this uh, group. This group is a place where we can find support, guidance, and inspiration. In my concluding remarks, I am thrilled to introduce to you Sedu Yarek as a valuable resource for our college's young research. I believe this initiative will play a pivotal role in fostering research culture that empowers young scholars to make significant contribution in the field of education. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the group called Yarek. As you can see on the slides that I've projected, we are here to serve as a dynamic and responsive research community of excellence within the 21st century. And that goes as our mission statement. And I'll hand over to my co-presenter. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mulebuheng Ramulumba, and I'm the vibe in the group. So I'm here to introduce the executive committee. Here we have our chair, uh, Dr. Samulo Mbiza, who is a lecturer in the mathematics education. And then we have Mr. Nati. Who is Nati? Okay, Nati is a researcher in the Institute for Open Distance Learning. And then we have Mr. Victor, please show your face. He's a lecturer in curriculum and instructional studies. Ooh, and then here we have the sexy Ms. Togazan, Dr. Togazan, Askis, Askis. Can I just rephrase Dr. Togazani? 
She's a where are you? Here she is. She's a lecturer in early childhood education and development. Okay, we have a missing child, ne? I don't know where this child is. Uh, Dr. Elvis is in Bloemfontein somewhere. Uh, he's a lecturer in adults' community and continuing education. We miss you wherever you are. And then we have Dr. Shabalala, who just graduated last night. She's a lecturer. No, she's not a lecturer in adults' community and continuing education. She's from the best department in this college, the Department of Science and Technology Education. Please recognize. And then we have Mr. Zondo, a lecturer with Mr. Zondo. Okay, I'm meeting my family for the first time today, so I need to verify. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Zondo is a lecturer in mathematics education. Hi, Bo. Okay, we had uh, the sexier version of me, but they decided to put me with my green hair. Because every month, it just depends on the weather, what color my hair will be. So here we have Ms. Ramulomo. Uh, I'm the communication specialist, as you can hear. I speak the latest version of English. Um, so I'm a lecturer in the best department, again, emphasis on the best, science and technology education. Okay, and then now I'm going to head back. Oh no, hand over to our chair, who's going to be talking about developmental goals and opportunities for our initiative. Mr. Chair. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Program Director, Dr. Tiggs as you are known in this group. You know, uh, one thing about this group before I even start colleagues is the vibe that Rams is referring to. And not just the vibe, man. Uh, these people are so, so much innovative and uh, they are so knowledgeable. Just give them the space and they will do wonders. So thank you so much for that. As uh, indicated on the slide, I am Dr. Modo. I am the founding chairperson of Yarik, and it's nice, man. It feels so nice to be here, you know? Um, and the reason why I'm saying that is because um, throughout the other universities where I've been, I have had the privilege uh, of uh, working in different universities in South Africa. And I can tell you there's always that pushback, you know, when it comes to young people taking up space. Uh, there's always that pushback, uh, the lack of support that comes uh, with it, you know, uh, to ensure that young people are supported and they are empowered to take up the research space and cement themselves. And that's why we are actually formulating uh, or now launching this particular dynamic group. That I can tell you, that this particular group aims to wow you in all areas of research. Just give us space, be it in math education, be it, be it in educational foundations, be it in science education, which is the best department as you had, you know. And I concur with that, Rams, uh, before I even start again, that it is the best department. You know why? because that is where the majority of the young people in this particular group come from. So, yeah. So it shows, it shows that the Department of Science and Technology Education is serious about addressing issues of ensuring that there are young people who are incorporated into the system that are also empowered. This a musical item here. Yeah. So before I even start, I hope it's going to play uh, even for those who are online. You can play. Oh, okay. So we'll pass. Uh, because we want to show you that we are vibing, but at the same time, we can actually um, farm and actually get together and talk about issues that affect us, but also in configuring strategies that we can use, you know, to create change in the world, because that's what it's all about. It's not just about research, 
It's not just about us coming together and counting numbers and saying that nine people from science or all of us are 45 or 42. No, it's about impact. It's about coming together and doing quality research and ensuring that we actually support each other from within. So what uh, Yarig actually does, and what I have seen since March uh, 2023, believe you me colleagues and um, those who are joining us online, this particular group is here to stay. Because we, we, we know of initiatives uh, that come or that are actually supported, but uh, you find that they just vanish into thin air. We want um, 150 years to come as we're celebrating 150 years, we want to see Yarig still in existence. Of course, uh, some of us are not going to be there to witness it, but we're going to lay a solid foundation to ensure that those who are going to come after us find a home when they get to UNISA. The young people under 40 are going to be embraced by this particular community. That's what we're trying to build here. And over the past months, you know, when we meet in, in our meetings, you know, uh, you'll dread when there is a meeting um, invite uh, that says, okay, come. Uh, there's a meeting. You'll, you'll dread going to this particular meeting. But believe you me, when there's a Yarig meeting, you see people rushing into the meeting even 15, 20 minutes prior to the meeting even commencing. And that shows the commitment that these people are serious about uh, ensuring that this particular structure gets established. Let me not get carried away, because I talk too much. So thank you, Prof. Gassa, for uh, this particular uh, structure and all the colleagues in the um, Institute. Uh, we thank you so much. Uh, the Vice Chancellor, Deputy Vice Chancellor, the deans uh, in their respective portfolios, our directors and CODs. Thank you so much for this particular uh, platform. And like I said, we aim to please, but not only please, but we are going to deliver high quality and impactful research that is not only going to be impactful amongst ourselves, but globally. It gives me a great pleasure to start off with achievements. And the reason why we are starting off with achievements is that Prof. Gaza said uh, we started in March, but we're already busy in our little corners, isolated in our little body corners. You'll hear uh, in the room, the language is body this, body that. So we call each other body in this group, you know? So in our little uh, corners, we'll actually engage and say body ticks, which is Tokozani, uh, our um, secretary, uh, deputy uh, secretary there. And we'll actually have conversations about how to uh, do impactful research or how to ensure that uh, we finish our PhDs on time, uh, how to ensure that our, um, we we'll get uh, the, the, these grants, uh, you know, NRF rating and, and, and all the things we're here for all of it, you know? So we're starting off with the graduations. Um, we have the new doctor with Dr. Chavalala. Uh, she was graduating uh, last night. So congratulations to Dr. Chavalala. I know she's not in the room because she was graduating in KZN, but a huge congratulations. And then we have Dr. Picture, photo. She's there in the room. Photo, please stand up. Congratulations, my uh, sister. And we know that this is just the beginning because we're on hashtag future professor. Yeah. And we have uh, Dr. Blose, uh, yet to be conferred though, uh, but we know that it's in the bag. So colleagues who are working here. And we have also some of the grants uh, that were awarded, you know, and we are working. Uh, our deputy chairperson, for example, holds an external grant. HSRC, yeah. Yeah, from the HSRC for an imaging researcher. You know, so we are working and uh, not only within UNISA, but also outside UNISA. Uh, we have the chairperson, 
Mulo, uh, who has NRF to took a competitive grant uh, by the NRF, who are working and it shows. We also have um, an NRF rated uh, scholar amongst ourselves, who's uh, Dr. Elvis Nguana, is Y rated, and we love it for that. So I'm saying that there are hours in this NRF rating, believe you me, like I'm saying, we are working. There are eight members who already applied for Tutuga from this particular group, and we're confident that those particular applications are going to be successful. And we've also applied for NRF rating for the 2023 academic year. And we are also confident that those particular applications are going to be successful. In this particular group, I, we did not even bother to come because we're going to shock you when it comes to actually reporting on our research outputs. So we have submitted and already published uh, papers and um, also book chapters as well as conference proceedings. And when the report comes out, Prof, Prof Gaza, you'll want to put money on the table. Thank you. Unfortunately, I'm hearing that you can't play. Um, that one you can play. Oh, we can play this one. Play so that was uh, Dr. Shabalala to show that we are taking up space and we're doing things differently. I'm not sure if the sound is coming up. Okay. Can we play it again, please? I hope those who are joining us uh, on Teams are able to get a better sound. But that was Dr. Shabalala as she was graduating at the University, uh, rather at the University of uh, South Africa uh, in KZN. And we have Dr. Photo. I don't see the photo of Dr. Photo, but there she is. There she is again, colleagues. That's Dr. Please stand up uh, for them to see you. That's Dr. Photo. So thank you so much, uh, colleagues. In terms of the um, goals uh, or some of the opportunities in this uh, particular group, I'm going to allow our um, uh, deputy uh, chairperson, uh, Nati Vish, uh, who's uh, Dr. Nati, to actually take us through some of these uh, opportunities uh, that you can have in Yareg. Yareg is such a dynamic space, uh, colleagues. And like I said, we're committed to coming together and supporting each other to produce high quality and impactful research. And these are some of the opportunities uh, that we've committed to. Uh, actually support each other, the, 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 some of the pathways that are going to follow to support each other to realize those particular dreams that we have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you, Program Director, and uh, thanks to you, Chair. Uh, colleagues, good morning. Morning. Good morning, colleagues. Um, I want to to say, Prof. Kasa, we are grateful for introducing this initiative to us, and also distancing yourself and say you guys take over, <laughs> and we have done that. Yeah. Thanks to the leadership that. Uh, um, you have actually so in us. Uh, for me, this is transformation. Uh, this is transformation because okay. for me, this is transformation. So, 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 so can you please touching the mic because it's creating some biases. Ye yes, I got it. Yes. Yeah. Um, I was saying, colleagues, for me, this is transformation because. Now this is a group of people who are under the, 40, the age of 40 years, yet they have achieved a lot. Uh, this is something that took our parents or the previous generations a minimum of 40 years 
to achieve. And as said, we host one of the youngest PhD graduates. So I think we are doing well and we should give ourselves another big round of applause. Now, as the group, we had um, a series of meetings. We sat down, we discussed uh, what should be the objectives, our mission and activities that we should embark on. Now, I'm going to share with you all the activities and the opportunities that we are pursuing. But all these um, do not suggest that we don't appreciate the support that the institution and the college has given us. Instead, it is our way of saying we acknowledge all the financial support and other forms of support that we have received which have somewhat skyrocketed our careers in a manner that we probably missed certain phases in our career trajectory that could have immersed us into becoming complete scholars. So we are trying to fill those gaps, but please do not just see us as a group of young people who are filling gaps. No, we are a capable group of young people who have proven themselves through the publications, through the grants that we are holding currently as the chair admitted. So when you look at us, don't I think no feeling no, 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 no. Instead, we have organized ourselves as a young group of people who who are dynamic and responsive to the current challenges facing the 21st, uh, 21st century higher education so that we can respond to the challenges such as artificial intelligence as it poses a threat to higher education, the quality of research, ethics, and so forth. So all these are activities that we have planned in response to that, in response to the UNISA strategic plan, to the development needs of the country, and obviously towards ensuring the next generation of scholars. So we plan to obviously build essential research skills, build a research and innovation network of young uh, colleagues from across disciplines and other SEDU areas, access support uh, resources, work together to generate funding for uh, group research developmental activities, and to develop uh, professional relationships and connections. So um, how we are going to do this is we've categorized the activities that we are going to do into about 13 categories. Yes, we will rely on um, the financial support uh, in order to pursue some of them, but some of them we actually, because of the capacity that we have, actually pursue them without the necessary or without any wherewithal to do so. So these activities that we are going to, or we are planning to embark on include, we say do young academics writing retreats. We are planning to have uh, two retreats per year. Uh, we are already deliberating on that. Academic uh, writing training seminars. I'm not sure, I think we've had one already. Uh, Development of a virtual writing center. I can report that yesterday some colleagues were already grilling the chairperson um, on his paper, and I think it was a, a fruitful, uh, <laughs> very right. Yeah. So um, a conference attendance. Uh, I'm I'm glad that uh, we've got uh, colleagues who have already done that. Some of you uh, attended the Namibia conference. Uh, I know even our young PhD graduate attended, so that's a good thing for us. Submission of at least one to three research articles per year. I mean, yes, we know that we have a, a minimum uh, threshold that we should meet as staff members, but this is for our self-development, and this is also a response to the developmental needs of the country because we not only uh, operate to serve our own interests, but we are 
aligned. We are operating in an ecological system, and therefore we need to respond to the National Development Plan, the 10-year innovation uh, plan, and so forth. Apply for working group funding. Uh, that's what we are planning to do as well. Apply for external comp uh, competitive uh, scholarships. We do have uh, researchers who are under 40 who are already having that experience. Apply for internal and external competitive grants. Establish an interdisciplinary party system. Create victories of the month, reflection and support platforms. Apply for NRF rating. I'm glad that some of the colleagues have already applied. Uh, shut up and write working groups. And obviously, because we are still young, other non-research related uh, focus, Ekalatina, yes. But uh, colleagues, um, we're also working on uh, uh, mental health issues. We know that there are internal and external factors that affect one's mental health. But as a, a network of young people, we try to give each other a helping hand. And we also urge everyone to say, behind every person smiles, we don't know what um, where they come from, what their background is. So if we can all try and make, say, do a conducive environment for everyone so that we can maintain their mental health. We appreciate your support and thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jefferson. You know, um, as you're busy uh, speaking, I'm like, we deserve a young spokesperson at UNISA. And this is the person who's going to defend our institution against all those uh, attacks out there. And the launch of Yari comes at a better time when UNISA is so much under attack, you know? And I believe that as the young academics who are bringing the new voice, the new vibe, and we're going to take up space and ensure that UNISA is well represented uh, both uh, locally and internationally. We're taking up that particular space and we're not going to look back. That is the declaration that we're making to say, as the Seju Young Academics Research Interest Group is going to start with us, that we're going to actually change the narrative about UNISA. We're going to change the narrative about UNISA. We're going to change the narrative about Seju. We're going to change the narrative about South Africa itself. So we're taking up that particular space, colleagues. Uh, for our mothers and fathers, just do a reminisce of when you were 30, 40, 50, 60, you know? And find it in your heart to allow us to grow, to be where you are. You have had your time and you have enjoyed and you continue to enjoy. Allow us to grow, allow us to fly. And we're going to take up this particular space and cement ourselves. We're gonna come back to this. I am quickly going to introduce some of these dynamic members that we'll speak about. Because someone can say, ah, no, that, that one was staged. You know, that one was staged. All those white t-shirts. I know. <laughs> you know? Uh-uh. We exist. Um, I'm going to introduce all the Yarik members. Starting with uh, Mr. Sianda Tele, who is a lecturer in the Adults Community and Consuming Education Department. We have Mr. Purua uh, Pumuzo, lecturer, Adults Community and Consuming Education. And we have um, other ones from Adults Community and Consuming Education, uh, lecturer Mr. Tulani Chauke. Unfortunately, we didn't get this picture. We have the dynamic and uh, very vibrant Mrs. Bakang Chite uh, from the Curriculum and Instructional Studies. We have Mrs. Uh, Christy Kotz uh, from Curriculum and Instructional Studies. We also have Ms. Noma Shubi Sicha, uh, lecturer, Curriculum and Instructional Studies. So you can see, colleagues, which departments yeah, are important about addressing issues of ensuring that young people are in their departments. Because when we speak about the succession uh, plan, the young people are supposed to be in the system. It cannot be that we still hold up space and not create spaces or open up opportunities for young people to take up space and grow within the institution. 
We have, again, in curriculum and instructional studies, Prof. and Vic, you are doing a good job. <laughs> we have uh, Mr. Nduduzo Tabashe and Dr. Ntando Ame Zidlamini. And now we move over to uh, early childhood education. Dr. Mzoli Mnanga uh, is online. Uh, we also have Mrs. Aisha Karim from Early Childhood Education and Development. We have Mrs. Tembeka Miende uh, from Educational Foundations. Sure. Uh, secretary, uh, let me go back to it there. So our secretary is also from Early Childhood Education and Development, uh, not this one, but our uh, program director for, for this morning. Uh, she's from Early Childhood uh, Education. So also, ECD is also doing a good job. We have um, Mrs. Miende, and we have Dr. Ntoko Zondwandwe from Educational Foundations. Educational, uh, so we have a postdoctoral uh, fellow, uh, Dr. Precious Muzite. So it's not only uh, the colleagues who hold uh, academic positions, but who also embrace uh, our postdoctoral fellows because we believe that they are here to develop uh, into scholars, into academics of note, and we welcome them in this particular group. We have Dr. Pime Longidi, uh, Language, Education, Arts and Culture, one of the grillers in the uh, Visual Writing Center. It will give you constructive feedback, and when you move from there, you really uh, think twice about how you want to structure your paper. We have the vibrant uh, Ms. Duduzile Penelope uh, Zwane uh, in Language, Education, Arts and Culture when it comes to issues of dancing, believe you me. <laughs> but not only dancing, huh? She's good, a very good academic. Then we have Miss Kimila. Uh, she runs this one. She's a runner. <laughs> Not running away from the uh, actual group, but she's a professional runner and a great academic uh, in language, education, arts, and culture. And we have Dr. Uh, Tulin Tulin from the best department, science and technology education. And we have Dr. Photo, science and technology education. We have Mr. Katusha Romunasi, uh, Science and Technology Education. We have Mr. Lawrence Masube, Science and Technology Education. Present. We have Mrs. Jody Lee uh, Hussein from Science and Technology Education. Then we have Mr. Samuel Mampa from Science and Technology Education. We have Ms. Masagu Chwene, Science and Technology Education. So, colleagues. I still have more. Oh, we still have more. Yes. Oh, from science and yes. oh. you see, Dr. Letasi Kosana, our youngest graduate at UNESA, from science and technology education. And then we have Dr. Princess Blose again, uh, science and tech. Dr. Ernest Mazibe, believe you me, you come, you come to our virtual writing retreat you'll get formative feedback, believe you me. One of the guys, Dr. Ernest uh, Mazive. Then we have Ms. Arieta Nakane, Science and Tech, and uh, Katuchero Munasi, Science and Tech. So this is just to demonstrate uh, to all the CODs uh, present in this room and also online to say, create spaces. Dr. Madigizala Madi, your department, ma. let's create space for young people. We have uh, met education, uh, Matlati Moila. We have Dr. Faiza Ghani, uh, who is the coordinator, quality assurance uh, in SEDU. We have Dr. Kelly Young in the IOTL. Other uh, IOTL members are Ms. Uh, Sharon Rose uh, Sefura. Then we have the postdoctoral fellow uh, who's part of the UNESCO chair ODL, Dr. Akintolu uh, Murikino. And we have the youngest member in the group, uh, Ms. Ineling uh, Sivate, an aspiring academic. She's in administration, but she aspires to become an academic and we are supporting her. Uh, we have also Ms. Kutu Sindisiwe, who's also an admin. She holds a master's. And she is going to become an academic. 
So colleagues, I am going to allow now Vic and Rams. That's how we call each other, I'm Mulo. Vic and Rams. And then there is Tix, who's our uh, uh, chairperson uh, or the, the person who's uh, the program director this morning. She's called Tix. There's Vic. And uh, Prof. Jojo in your adult corner, she's called uh, Jakes, okay? Uh, so I'm going to allow them now to have a bit of a conversation or reflection with some of our members on what we've done so far. Just a brief conversation with our members, just to show you that we are working. Thank you, Chair. Um, due to time, I'm just going to call upon the speakers that are going to have a conversation with. Um, Dr. Precious, you may remain seated where you were. Uh, Ms. Bakang, uh, quickly come to the floor. And then Dr. Ngidi, uh, also join us onto the stage as we reflect on this journey. Um, I'm not, um, I'm seeing my COD there, Professor Van Vick. Make sure please your mic is on. Um, Professor Gaza, please also make sure that your mic is yeah, on. Be very ready. Yeah, um, as we want to have a quick dialogue, hopefully in five minutes we'll quickly finish this conversation. Um, these also some of the activities that have been happening in this um, group. So, Dr. Precious, um, as one of the members who have been attending some of these activities that we have organized recently, can you briefly um, reflect on your experiences and the impact potential of these activities? Yeah, um, hopefully the, the, mic the mics are working there. All right. Um, morning, everybody. Um, so as you uh, have been said, I'm Dr. Precious. I'm, sitting, I'm one of the postdoctoral fellows um, in the educational financials uh, department. Um, so I'm just going to quickly reflect on my experience with the writing virtual space, which I think is very pertinent when we talk about research and, uh, and, and all the things that comes with the developmental goals uh, in terms of publications and all that. So I'm one of those people that uh, put himself first uh, on the blog uh, just after by the chair uh, to, to really share on my, you know, the output that I'm currently working on, which is an article that I'm co-writing with Prof. Uh, um, so I wasn't quite sure which space I've been, because I've been in a lot, lot of virtual spaces, including reading groups, and most of them believe in you. Some of them are very intimidating, and, and, and you get to feel that they're being weighed on and all that. But then with this particular Yarik virtual space, it's not at all intimidating. And they are very, you know, people that are regal, that give you you know, good feedback, and it's it, you kind of feel that you're in a family space where you're not judged, but you get this positive feedback. Um, so in re with regards to where we see this virtual space growing, I see it growing in a way that um, we, when we meet our development goals, so I feel, you know, the writing is the part that actually gets us to to be, you know, meeting these development goals, and uh, I hear that we could talk about shut up and write uh, phrase, where we can actually write and then we share those space um, articles in that space. So I see, you know, we're having a lot of also members that are coming to that writing space, and we have what we call critical writers, readers uh, that actually give write. I mean, read your article uh, way before we can actually engage with it, and I see it also, you know, being fruitful in that space. So we actually have it every other Wednesday. Um, and we had it last Wednesday, and so that was an experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Precious. We are going to move over to Bakang. Uh, Bakang, how do you envisage this space, um, whether it be academically, personally, or any other sphere? Um, you know what, I think it just gave me an opportunity to first touch on representation because that's the core of my answer to your question. Um, I believe that representation is so important because it 
puts you in a position where you are surrounded by people that are either coming from the same background as you, same circumstance, or even maybe the same age, who are doing exactly what you want to do, or who even better have achieved what you want to achieve. So being in this young and dynamic academic group, it's really helped me a lot because then I'm surrounded by people that are doing all that I thought would be, you know, deemed to be far-fetched. And seeing young people that are achieving all these goals and dreams that I have for my for myself. So in terms of different spheres, I can touch on my okay, let's get personal on, on the personal level, you know, to say there is nothing in as much as we've all got our own goals as you know, um, young, young, young academics, and I've got mine already set, but there's nothing as um reassuring as feeling like you're not isolated, that you're not an island, you know. And finally, I belong to a group where when I need that reassurance, I mean, I'm surrounded by young moms and I have myself, you know, whereas in the department when I joined UNISA, I didn't have anyone of the same age group that I could pick up the phone and say, hey, listen, do you know that I've spent an entire week without reading an article or without drafting anything? And whereas you are told every single day you need to write a sentence, and I'm like, I didn't write a sentence for two weeks, <laughs> you know, and the months that are in academia that say to me, it's okay. I went through the same thing last week. My child was off sick and I couldn't touch anything. But God, we are catered somewhere and we are going to achieve our goals, you know? And lastly, on the academic sphere, uh, where it's really impacted, man, it's done a great lot for me. When I joined Tunisia, and I'm going to just say this for the sake of vulnerability, because why we have this chat if I'm not going to be open enough, you know? I joined Tunisia in 2021, and I used to feel so insecure to share my wildest dreams because I used to feel like... Who do you think you are? <laughs> you're surrounded by people that she are only reach a professorship at 60, 50. And you want to come here and tell us you want to reach professorship at, I'm not going to mention it yet. <laughs> and you know what? I, I joined this group. I met Tokozani, who's 30, who's a, who's a doctor. I met Dr. Skosana, who's 27, who's a doctor. I talked to Vic, who's almost becoming a doctor, I interact with Dr. Scott, Miss Potter, who's, you know, everyone else who's inspiring me and who's making me feel like, listen, girl, your dreams are not far-fetched. Yes. And I'm going to say it now because it's not far-fetched mm. that I will be a professor by 40 and I'm also not saying yes. at 40. Yes. I'm saying by 40. You know, it, it, I'll, I'll tell you what has propelled me and what has encouraged me so much is belonging to this group and I'm so grateful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna move over to the last speaker that we have here. Uh, Dr. Ngidi, one of the <laughs> most intimidating in our future yeah, space. We, we are all afraid of him. Uh, Dr. Ngidi, uh, what stands out for you about this group? <laughs> And good morning to everyone, and no, thank you very much. And I think what, what stands out for me is the patience that we have for one another. When we read, like we've said, when, when, we, when we lambast each other, when we tell each other that which, with whatever that we have as, as a draft, as a text, it's incorrect. And the manner in which we respond to each other, one may assume that within our discourse, um, there is a, a senior person who's older, who's maintaining even the type of a language to use, you know. So it's 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 how we are so hands on and so committed to the core, you know, because so for, for for the information, some of us are twenty nine. Also graduated when I was twenty seven. So, so plan is to be a professor when we are 35. Yeah, the latest. <laughs> so this is this is very nice. Okay, I'm already 35. <laughs> so this is very, very nice uh, uh, and, and very, very, very stretching, uh, if I may tell you. And we know with our department, Prof. Manike will spend almost uh, 45 minutes stressing the issue of research. So it's not necessary that some of us we want to be like this, you know, when we are anyway, when we go, it's that. And UNISA is, is, is very, 
um, 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 uh, condemning when it comes to research. So we, we are thankful to our SODs as well, uh, COTs, sorry, and, and everyone, like your chairperson that we have and everyone else. So the most important thing for me, I would say, we need to be committed to this and we'll see ourselves becoming whatever that we wish to be. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, colleagues, because of time, we're going to cut our program a little bit. But we have our last question for our mother. Yes. So you have this dynamic group now that are very vibrant in the 20s, 30s, 30s, yeah. What would you say to your 30-year-old self now? Like, what advice would you give to us? And very quickly. The other one. Yeah. It's okay. Oh, this is a difficult one. Uh, I wish I had um, this opportunity that you are having now. And um, just to be um, in a safe corner with um, my own um, uh, peers like um, age group wise, because uh, you know when you get into academia and you find people who are older than you and always tell you, uh, you must do this, you must do that, uh, you tend to uh, fear to get into some of the spaces. If I was, um, what I can say to myself, <laughs> if I can go back and be young, I will say, um, don't look back. Wow. Just go forward. Don't be afraid. Just um, get into any space that you can feel that it is comfortable with you. Don't wait for somebody to push you. Just um, do your best and excel in everything. Because with that, um, it will um, show even the people who will try maybe to say, no, don't do this. You know, when you are younger and very young, every time when the child is touching something, say, no, mm. you don't have to touch this. And um, that is where the child is exploring when it's touching everything. So I was going to allow myself to explore, to excel, not to look back and only have a focus. Because sometimes we lose a focus when we are in academia. When we come to academia, we find that um, maybe there is no way. We think that the, the, the research space is um, um, reserved for a certain goal. And for us, it's just to sit down and um, do um, uh, modeling and forget about research. So I was going to say to myself, work for 24 hours. Because uh, we know most of the time, um, the research is done after hours. Mm -hmm. We don't do research during office hours. During office hours, we sit on the modeling. Then after hours, that's when we start research. doing research. So I was going to tell myself that, okay, let me not complain saying I want to do research. And um, now I want to do research as my hope so that I can be able to do better. Because now, if you think that research is a job, you are not going to um, 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 uh, be successful in research. Just take the research as a hobby, then run with it. Yeah. And do it at any time that is compatible for you. And uh, don't wait saying, no, I'm now closing my laptop because it is four o'clock. I'm no longer going to do it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Gaza, for those wise words and advice to 
majority of us who are in this space. Uh, as I've already explained, due to time, the program, we wanted to also talk to our CODs. We wanted to ask them to pledge their support to this dynamic group. If you have seen on the presentation by our chairperson, um, I think the number there, there was a mistake. Uh, science and technology education uh, has 15 members in it uh, that are in this group. And if you look at the other, the second biggest uh, or with the large number, I think it's curriculum with six uh, members. And the rest, they're averaging two, if not three. So there, that's the reason why I wanted to have a conversation with um, the COD to pledge their support in this group. But we're still going to come into your doors and we're going to knock on your doors. And hopefully we're going to have the space to have that conversation. And in those few words, I would say in my language, I guess, I thank you. Wow, there is an overwhelming sense of excellence in the room this morning, and it's it's amazing. It's amazing to see some of the people who we are on Moodle with, who are we who we are on teams with in this building today doing amazing things across the board. Some of the words that have stuck out this morning are words such as committed, hands-on, safe, representation, and stretching. That is what this launch of the SEDU Young Academics Research Interest Group is about. So thank you so much for that. We are now, without wasting any time, going into the next part of today's program, which is going to be the first panel discussion. The topic is research impact, juggling between academic and real world impact. Our moderator for this panel discussion is Dr. Samulo Mbiza. Dr. Mbiza, we welcome you to the stage. May we please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you so much, Tix. Um, so now we move on. And we're not moving uh, away from uh, Yarik per se, because now we want to hear from the best in the field as to how can Yarik members get to where they are, both in South Africa and internationally. May I please uh, request the panelists? I think you are. Thank you. So, um, uh, can I request that our panelists uh, who are joining us online, uh, please uh, share their cameras, their videos, so that I can uh, see who has managed to join us. I am seeing the beautiful faces of professors um, Sarah Bensilal, Professor Yasmin Abtai, I'm seeing uh, Dr. Najwa, I'm seeing Prof. Fatadeng, I am seeing Prof. Luneta, uh, Prof. Essien, are you there? And I'm not sure about uh, Prof. Q. Berry. Um, we're just working on the sound uh, in the room so that uh, the people in the room can also benefit from the discussions. Uh, Prof. Yasmin, can you please confirm that you can hear my sound? Thank you so much. So as I was saying, now we move over to uh, speak about impact. I would like to make this to be clear. Okay. So the topic for this uh, panel discussion is uh, 
research impact, juggling between academic and real world impact. My name is uh, Dr. Samuel Mbiza, and I'll be your moderator for this session. We have um, our um, panelists. I'm just going to do a brief introduction of our panelists. The first one is Professor Tony Essien, and Professor Essien is um, an associate professor in mathematics education and also an interim South African numeracy chair at the Vet School of Education. Uh, he was also deputy head of school for research at the Vet School of Education from June 2020 to September 2022. And we have uh, Professor Yasmin Abtai uh, joining us from Norway. She's a full professor of mathematics education in the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences. The next one uh, is uh, Professor Aslam Fata, and he is a distinguished professor in the Department of Education Policy Studies at Stellenbosch uh, University. And we have Professor Takoma Luneta, who is an NRF researcher and professor of mathematics education at the Faculty of Education at the University of Johannesburg where has been a member since uh, 2005. And we have Professor Sarah Bensila, who is an associate professor at the University of KZN, Department of Mathematics Education. And we have uh, Dr. Najwa, who is the chair for RITAL, which is Research in Innovation, Teaching and Learning uh, Organizing Committee and the head of department at Fundani CHED, a curriculum a development unit. So she's uh, from the University um, Cape Peninsula University of Technology. And we have another panelist, uh, Professor Q R Berry, uh, Q Berry, rather Robert uh, Q Berry, and he is the Dean of College of Education at the University of Arizona. These people, colleagues, were actually approached by Yarig. So we present to you the first uh, panel discussion. And I'm going to go back to the first uh, panelist, uh, who is uh, uh, Professor Abtai. Prof, good, good morning. Uh, you're going now to tell us, Prof, what it takes to become an impactful researcher um within the academy uh, can i hear if your sound is on prof Abtai, is your mic on are you able to hear us Mm, I'm not sure if colleagues on Teams can hear uh, Prof. Aptai. Ah. Uh, Yarig, uh, let's make things work. I don't know how we're going to get the sound to work. <laughs> Uh, but uh, science and technology is in the room, so we're going to try by all means to get the sound to work. They are saying on Teams uh, they can't. Uh... She she has unmuted. Yeah. Oh, 
keine Informationen, Computer ist nicht da. Ein Schiff? Ein Schiff. Ein Schiff. Uh, our ICT is assisting us colleagues online. Are you able to hear us? Yeah. Just give me a minute or so for them to assist us. Okay, can we try uh, that again? Uh, sorry, colleagues on Teams. Uh, can you unmute and 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 speak so that we 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 can you unmute on your side and speak? Um, but we have all the side. No one is speaking. Uh, Prof. Banslal, please try from your side. Uh, can you unmute and, and keep speaking so that we'll try to, to find the, the problem? Unmute and keep speaking. Don't can say whatever you can say. I'm I'm just trying to join with computer audio. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they can hear you, but um, we can't hear them. Are you able to hear us now? Good uh, morning, colleagues. Yeah, we no. can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, it's fine. You can, you can, we can start. I think it's it's sorted now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much uh, for that. And thank you for being patient with us. And things always work when we come together and just remain calm. And like I said, we are now moving into the first uh, panel discussion. And in this uh, particular panel discussion, we have uh, Prof. Yasmin Aptai, uh, Prof. Luneta, Prof. Um, Nigra, uh, Prof. Fata, Prof. Sarah Bensilal, and I think I need to admit uh, Professor Tony Essien into the meeting. Just, give, just bear with me, colleagues. Um, okay. Thanks, Pat. Uh, thank you so much, uh, colleagues. Uh, so we said that this particular panel discussion is a research impact. It applies to both the young, the old, the soon to retire, you know? And uh, it's about research impact. How, how do we juggle uh, between 
academic impact and also uh, impact outside of academia. So I'm going to start with um, our um, panelist, uh, Professor Yasmin Aptai. When you saw this topic, Prof, before we get uh, to the business of the day, what came to your mind? Um, um, can, can you hear me okay? Yes, we yeah. can hear you well now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation and uh, thanks for having me here. I uh, The first question in terms of uh, the impact, um, for me what comes to my mind is impact is more than just academic impact, uh, which then I'll unpack it later. There is also uh, capacity building, uh, that's part of um, um, the research impact informing policy. So it goes more up in the academic community and then parts of dissemination and also social impact, including uh, policy formation, and, uh, informing uh, practices. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that um, input. Prof. Luneta, let me uh, bring you in to this conversation. When you were given this particular uh, topic, when we invited you and you so gladly agreed uh, to come to be become one of the panelists uh, in this session, um, what really uh, came through in your mind? What was one thing that you said, this one I'm going to share? <laughs> Academic impact is an absolute necessity for every community and every for every individual as well as every society, really. Uh, so, however, impact basically is looked at from several perspectives. Uh, like uh, Yasmin has alluded to, there is a social perspective as well, which is very critical, and to not only the the research and the citations that, 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 uh, that are looked into. But how impactful is one in terms of the people that they interact with? What do they learn from the individual? And, and how much does the individual inform the society? And I think that those are the issues that are just coming out as I was thinking about this conversation. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, particular um, uh, contribution. And we're hearing that it's not just about uh, the publications, you know, it goes beyond that. And we're going to delve uh, deeper into uh, that just now. Uh, but let me uh, welcome also uh, Prof. Na Dr. Najwa into the conversation. Doc, uh, when you were invited, what what was that spark, uh, you know, in your in your mind when you thought of research and impact, uh, the external world or the outside world? What was one of the things that stood out for you in this particular topic? Please get to it. And the most of the match where I am is that tension between research and, and teaching. It's the one thing that really uh, stood out for me and we had to navigate that tension. Um, and to be able to, to make an impact, you need to be like the uh, as we mentioned, the issue of policy. It's like it's a uh, also uh, uh, mentioned policy. It's quite important for you to be aware of the policy that depends um, and as well as technical implications as well. You need to be able to disseminate the practical uh, uh, application of your research to your audience, academic and non-academic audiences. Hmm. Thank you. Hope the enemy. We can hear you and yeah. Thank you so much uh, for that uh, insightful input. Uh, I want to hear from uh, Prof. Tony Essien, because, you know, for me, when I started, I was like, ah, I publish in the best journals, you know, and 
uh, since I publish in the best journals, it simply means that my work is going to be found and read uh, globally or internationally, you know, um, by the researchers in my field. So I don't actually have to worry about anything else. Am I right, Prof. Sian? Please come through. Because that's just impact. I, I publish, I do my research, I publish in high impactful journals, and my work is out there. That's impact, right, Prof? Yeah. Please hope you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, I apologize. My laptop connection was going on. I can't get my video on. But I have joined also on my phone. So if you can kind of um, let me also my phone, then you'll be able to see me. Okay, well, what do you do I'm, I'm trying to answer your question. Um, for me, there are at least two, I'm sure there are many more benefits in publishing in high impact or two journals in one field. Okay, the best is simple. One, um, two, um, Publishing in such journals could significantly um, increase one's citation and citation scores. And by that, all those things we know, H index, item index, and all that. The second, publishing in top journals in one's field could lead to more recognition in the field and all that this implies, including having a writing to give plenary lectures and total phrases in one field. So let's do that then. I publish in the best journals I can, which means my work is going to be found and read by all the important researchers in my field. So I don't need to do anything else, right? No. Thank you. I need to do something. Tell us. Let's well. start with the first. The conferences. You need to make yourself know. In conferences, and one of the ways of doing this is to join special interest groups, work with established and emerging scholars in a special interest group to produce more research, um, and lead some of those um, research work. I, I can't overemphasize the importance of networking, of course, when you are at a conference. Hmm. Hey, then the second thing you need to do, yes, you've published in high impact journals and you think everyone will see it. No, use platforms like ResearchGate, uh, Academia. Is, is that me echoing or? Yeah. That I, I think you, because you've taken both. Uh, What's the last one on your phone? No, I am um, muted, so it shouldn't be. Okay, can you uh, can you see me? Because if you can't see me, I just turn off my phone. We can't see you yet, Prof. We can't see you. Okay, so I'm just going to leave this. All right. Okay, so so the second thing is it's important to use platforms like ResearchGate, Academia, in your and, and so on and so forth. Or upload your publications on social media, on social media platforms also, like um, Facebook, Instagram, and even LinkedIn. And of course, as you publish, update your profile. Hmm. And the third thing I noted here is simply that you actively seek to be involved in working with people in your niche area outside of conferences. Form research groups, meet and do joint research to, together. So collaboration is very important. It is also collaboration through collaboration that people get to know your work. Mm -hmm. and, um, and always remember that one of the elements mentioned this. Always remember one thing. Why it is important for well-established researchers to publish with other well-established researchers. They are also interested in publishing with you, with emerging researchers, rather. Um, because it is, it is in a way capacity to your own and, and, and that comes towards, you know, your contribution to scholarship. So then, um, 
So at the end of the day, please remember one thing. Remember that it is not about how many articles you have published, but also where you are publishing. And that is why for me, I, I, I thought you were going to ask me, wise men, and what, was, what came into my mind next when I thought about the topic. Well, what came into my mind was simple. Now we are talking. Because in a, in, a, in a situation where people are all about subsidies, 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 and where people go for the cheapest job possible to publish their work. Here we are talking about high quality journals, we're talking about impact. So that made me so happy that we are having these discussions because more and not, a lot of them, especially emerging ones, do not understand the importance of publishing in high quality journals. See that all journals you publish it must be high impact journals. The feedback is not coming from me because I've turned off my okay. So it is also not about how many citations you got or you are getting, but also who is citing you and the impact your work is making. And I'm more often than not. Your impact, the impact of your work is gained in terms of the contribution to scholarship that your work has made or is making. And this is usually your time is gauged through the lens of citing you as opposed to how many people are citing your work. Okay, so finally, and that's my last point. Do not sit on your novels, even after publishing in all these high impact journals. Go out there, get seen. Make yourself seen. When you are called upon to review papers in good journal, in journals, uh, of course, I'm not referring to the literary ones, don't mm -hmm. turn it down so easily. It's an extra sacrifice that I know, but please don't turn it down. And especially if you are called upon to be associate editor or editor of a journal, or to be part of an editorial board of a journal, again, remember that I'm not referring to predatory journals. Don't turn it down. In that way, you keep growing your career. Thank you very much. Sure, such an insightful um, feedback uh, or response, uh, Tony. And for me, what's standing out really is the need for us to be visible and ensuring that um, we publish in those high impact journals, but also put ourselves out there, go and network in conferences and ensure that we build a name for ourselves. Look, today you are here, you are our guest. It's because we see you as impactful in your community of practice. Thank you so much for that particular uh, response. Uh, let's uh, now um, go over to uh, Prof. Luneta. Prof, you know, traditional, when we speak about uh, the assessment of research impact, um, traditionally, they've actually focused too much on academic impact, whereas in reality, really, impact is measured by the uh, quality of research that you put out there, um, the indicators of change, uh, you know, outside the universities and also the research institutions, which is the real world, you know. I want us to delve into that particular conversation, linking it with a professor's need to go out there, be impactful and publish in high quality uh, journals. Uh, please take us through uh, your reflection on uh, this particular aspect of what really impact means in this particular regard. So, uh, I had two slides that I thought I would share. Yes, like I'm not allowed to share. So, in that case, then I will give them to myself and uh, read them from here. Uh, the first part that I looked at is uh, who does one increase impact and identify other than through publications. In other words, how does one increase one's impact other than through publications? I've looked at it from two uh, uh, from two angles. By basically looking at what we mean by academic first of all academic achievements, which is measured through Academic outputs such as personal examinations, dissertations, theses, and publications of academic articles. This is basically regarded as academic achievements. 
then also look at what do we regard as academic success. So academic success therefore is achieved through self-discipline, hard work, and staying ahead of one's course and end quitting. So these are areas that still push towards academic impact. Then uh, academic impact, of course, has is embodied within a uh, research impact, which is an actual fact and product of academic impact. And this is measured again through qualitative and quantitative methods, such as citation counts, the H index, which, by the way, is the most popular. The, the H index is regarded as the most popular. And if you all are aware of H index, is for instance, if you have five. Um, Index of five, that means that you have five papers that are cited at least five times. And index of eight, you have five, you have eight papers that are cited at least more than eight times. It's then also the G index, the IP index, and of course the Google Scholar and the Scopus and uh, Web of uh, Sciences. So these push towards what ones is, towards ones academic impact. However, how then do we think about the influence one's academic impact on the normal scholarship? Why, how do we regard one to be influential in the academia? And at a certain level of one's academic influence. Publishing in high impact journal is not still good enough because that to me is not really impactful. Why do I say that at a certain level? For instance, at my level as a full professor, how many of the people that I'm accounted uh, that are uh, not depend on me the teachers that are out there that are looking up to me read these high impact books, extremely zero. That if I did my publications in local newspapers, that is where my impact will be. Because the teachers will understand the conversations that I'm referring, I'm referring to, and they'll be able to reflect on that. My paper that has been published in this high academic uh, journal, not be read by the teachers, will not be read by frankly even my uh, district uh, education officer. But my conversation on a local television, on mathematics teaching and learning, my conversation on a, on a local community radio, on a place to teach you of a straight line, will be understood by those teachers out there. And that is what I regard as academic. Uh, impact. That is what I regard as being able to respond to the community and the, the, the people that we are responsible for is academic. Then it's critical indeed to publish in high impact journals for sure. But what I've read, and I've been very fortunate enough to have worked in a, uh, almost in all the five continents, and I've been to various uh, visiting to various universities as well. In a group of universities in the US, your high, highly published academics publish in their local newspapers as well. They are on their local radios as well. And that is impactful. And that is what we should be advocating. Now, the situation of policy in South Africa, where we only recognize contribution that comes out of an accredited job. That is low and myopic and is not going to be helpful. Because that means the teachers in my field in Togo are not going to write in their own newspaper. Why? Because nobody is going to read it. Who is regarded as an academia? And that to me is not education. So then when you talk about how then do we potentiate impact, I said one of the best ways is one, by planting good academic seed. What I mean by good academic seed is that 
your postgraduate output will influence your academic impact. They will carry your name. For instance, I have, I have, there, there are very few universities in the country where I don't have a student that I supervise to PhD. Now. Out of the 29, I think, uh, uh, out of the 26, I think 17 universities, I have one of my postgraduate students there. Since there are people that are going to some degree carry my name, I will ensure that they are the academics and support them all the way. And that is what I have to tell you guys about the academic empire. Again, of course, knowledge of the field is critical. It's important that I understand what is going on in mathematics education. And think about it. I read the latest conversations. I want to take the latest conversations. And we are also part. That is critical. You do attract admiration from my peers through critique of my work. And that also attracts invitation to keynote as keynote speakers. Like, for instance, I've been keynote speaker at Amnesty in June, June this year. Um, you, you, you are also invited to examine students to review modules and so on. So, social exposure to social interactions and community engagement is critical, and that is what I regard as impact. And of course, conference attendance and networking, all of these builds up what one regards as influential academic impact. And key to this, of course, is publication, but at a certain level, we need to publish even in our local spaces, publish even in our, be on our local radio stations and speak about education. Same will be part. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's it. Wow. You know, I thought, yeah, no, uh, academics are, 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 are those rated uh, researchers uh, are always emphasizing the need to uh, publish in high impact journals. And now you're like, that's not good enough. I'm really taken aback, uh, Prof. Lunette, and I think uh, I really need to go back to my little corner and into the young academics uh, research corner to really try and find other uh, innovative strategies then to ensure that will become impactful because if not publishing in high impact journals is not good enough you know we hear you and we really need to ensure that we take heed of all the things that you've actually uh, put forth in this particular response, uh, ensuring that um, the people on the ground, you know, that we are writing about, that we are writing for, uh, really get this information that it can actually influence the way in which they think, their ways of thinking, their ways of being, their ways of knowing about reality, you know. So uh, that for me is really standing out. Uh, let me go uh, to Prof. Uh, Yasmin. Um, Prof. Quickly, you know, um, researchers uh, miss uh, often, uh, and that that's also me included. Uh, often misunderstand the meaning of impact and think that it's all just about the results uh, of the projects that uh, one does or conduct. Uh, you know, what are some of the pathways uh, to research impact? What, what what would you say are some of the pathways to research impact? Because we often misunderstand it as just putting these papers out there, like uh, Prof. Luneta has just said, and Tony has just said, it's not just about publication. It goes beyond that. So what are some of the pathways that we can actually um, look at or take uh, to ensure that we become impactful? Um, thank you. I just wanted to know if um, is it any possibility that we could share a screen or it's not possible? Um, I'm struggling to uh, come and enable it from my side, um, but you can continue and I'll let you know once I'm able to do so. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. I started at the beginning by saying that dividing the impact into academic impact and the potential for social impact. Impact, break it down to a uh, so now we break it down to um, a little bit more. I think following what um, we are doing, and why I think I can hear other things as well. Yes. Um, 
Thank you. Can I just address the law of the writer? It's because one of the panelists has the microphone on and when you question, is the name is Amy Dunquan or something like that. So yeah, I think we also to correct it. Just turn off the microphone. One of the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so for the potential to academic impact, uh, as, as other colleagues have mentioned, I, I also have um, the uh, contribution to uh, scientific advancement that is a part of it, that includes the scientific advancement, also includes advancement in understanding of methods, of theories, the application of the research that you're working on. So sometimes when we publish in uh, highly uh, structured journals that are part of findings that are more important than others, but impact also comes from thinking about the theory you're using, the applications of the study you're having, the method, highlighting different parts of your study in different uh, publications you're writing. Then um, also, um, then also talking about the te the techniques that that you're using. Uh, more than that, then we get to training skills researchers, as also was mentioned. It's part of part of the impact you're having is uh, training skilled researchers. It's just what you're doing now. It's it and it's it will eventually have an impact when you're a group of young researchers working together, putting in these kind of conferences and seminars. It is um, your training skills researchers and you're also building capacity. Um, other than national collaboration, uh, national and international uh, collaboration within the field, one way to increase the impact is to uh, interdisciplinary collaboration. For example, I work for, with uh, mathematics and social justice. I could, I could collaborate with colleagues in human rights education because they know much more than me about human rights. I probably know more than them about mathematics education. And that would be another kind of impact when we make our field more interdisciplinary. And the other pathway, the other kind of impact, and I'm still within academia, is to try to open and to publish open access. I know it, it is expensive, but sometimes libraries would have resources for that, or a um, small fund could become available. Sometimes journals themselves have some fund available for open access, and that is another way to uh, have uh, uh, impact. Then um, the other thing that I wanted to talk uh, is um, potential for social impact. And social impact, um, one of the most, at least in Norway, when we talk about social impact, impact, we immediately go to the UN Sustainable Goals and see our work is impacting which of these, I think now there are 21, which of these uh, um, 21, uh, uh, so the uh, millennium sustainable uh, millennium, millennium goals. Um, and aside from that, which I think I have an image in my um, in my uh, PowerPoint that I'm reading through, and uh, the, the uh, sustainable goals number four, the quality and education. It's usually, it has a lot of details of what one can do to have social impact in education. So one way to look at um, the point of social impact you might have is to actually look at the UN website and see the goals of the UNESCO website and see the educational goals they have. Um, then I have another slide that talks a little bit about um, I'm going to read it, and actually I'm just going to read it. So economic and social impact is demonstrated, the demonstrable contribution being that, in, sorry, that, that um, benefits individuals, 
organization and the nation as a whole. So to increase the impact, as mentioned by other colleagues, it's within your local community, within your organization, when you do works like this in terms of uh, putting seminars, and also a national impact when you apply for funding for NFR funding, um, that would be your uh, national impact. If you would also consider accountability, and quality, and the maximum benefit. And accountability is when you're conscious about the public money that you're getting and the kind of impact you're having on the society. It is not just research. When we work in universities, we are we are somehow paid by the tax money, so we're accountable to our social surrounding. And quality by keeping in mind what the beneficiaries of your work. When you're writing, who are the audiences? Who you want to address? Who would benefit from what you're saying? That could be the teacher, that could be students, could be the policy makers, could be your colleagues who are not in your context. And all that put together, it will increase the quality of your work. And then, yeah. And then the last thing that I made is a table, which I'm trying to count So it is, it is kind of a little bit, I have gone a little bit deeper into um, communication, dissemination, and, and utilization. This game, what about, to who, or what for? So communication would be, about the project and the results. And then the dissemination would be the results of your study. And then utilization would be when you're making the results useful for scientific, social, and economic purposes. And when you communicate to whom you could have multiple audiences, Usually the dissemination, you will have it for your peers, for professional organization and for policy makers. And then the utilization of your work is to make the, your results concrete for use. Sometimes when we publish in academic like journals, we're not paying attention to who else could be interested in the finding and how I can tweak things around to make these public findings results useful, concretely useful for that audience. For example, if there are teachers, could you make a booklet, an activity book, kind of sort of professional development? So what kinds of things you can do that are specific and concrete to the kinds of audience you are you are talking to? And then what for? The communication would be to inform and reach out to society and show the benefit of your research. For the dissemination, it would be to enable use and uptake of the results. So when you have a result, someone can build on your results going forward. And then as for the utilization of what for, to make the best effort of all re that all results generated during project or during your study or whatever is in use. So for me, just to wrap it up, it's about having specific audience and a specific time in mind and see it concretely useful for those audience, socially and academically. Thank hmm. you. Thank you so much. And I, I, I like that uh, last point that you're making, uh, the need to have an audience uh, within a specific time, you know, and that I Can think you, you can't hear me. Yes. Um, um, are you able to hear me now? Yes. Thank you. So thank you so much uh, for that input, uh, Yasmin.
uh, what's standing out for me is that a particular point that you're making at the end to say, uh, you know, you need to have a specific audience, uh, those who are going to read your research in the academic site, your research, and be able to collaborate with you. Uh, those become your audience. But also there are those that are on the ground uh, addressing issues of um, the social nature of research, uh, linking those two, you know, uh, ensuring that um, you make those linkages and uh, partnerships uh, on, the, on, on the ground. Uh, that for me is the question of the who are you doing this particular research for? And they need to marry uh, between the two. And with that, thank you so much. Uh, let's move uh, over to Prof. Aslam Fata. And I want us to have a bit of a conversation around impact, Africanization of curriculum and pedagogy, and also uh, the aspects of decolonization. Uh, because I'm hearing Yasmin uh, speaking about the issues of context, the social context, you know? So let's delve a bit into the Africanization of the curriculum and pedagogy, as well as the decolonization of the two uh, in terms of research impact. What does it mean uh, within this particular context then. Profata? Is Profata still with us? Okay, I think uh, Profata uh, has left uh, the meeting because of an engagement. There was a message to say you can still let him in. Oh, let's uh, quickly see. Yeah, but I, I don't have him uh, in the lobby. Waiting. Oh, okay. Uh, can we move uh, to uh, Professor Sarah Benzlal? You're already there. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, Tell us then in terms of context, which links uh, closely, I think, to the issues of Africanization and decoloniality. Uh, does context really matter in planning, capturing, communicating, and monitoring your research impact? Would you say context uh, matters or research impact is uh, not contextual? Okay, thank you very much. I want to make uh, one, two slides here. Your question as does context matter in using your research to make an impact? And to say yes, answer to that is important. When, when you said in, uh, when you do a bit of research and you write it up, if you stick focused on the small picture, you find it difficult to look at the bigger picture. I think what other people have spoken about. Then it's very um, important for you to try to look back, back and see where is that little research in the bigger picture. And what are you what could you possibly be saying? Because you must be clear, you must think about what is the significance of the stuff, what is the contribution of the stuff. Because often when we find um, articles sent to us, it's focusing on that micro without actually moving into a bigger picture and trying to locate where is your study contributing, how could it be possibly saying to the bigger pictures. Hmm. So I just wanted to give an example of um, a study that we did in Rodeta's book uh, two years ago. Well, how it was just a small study about the perceptions of teachers about this program that they have been enrolled in. And so the findings are just the usual findings about programs. The, the, the teacher said the lecturers did not find, did not spend enough time explaining. They had too much work to cover. They were under stress. The tests and exam schedules are too tight. There's difficulty in getting resources from the library. So this was the results of the study. Because then take a picture now about this program itself. And you realize that actually these are teachers studying in the holidays while they have a full teaching load. Furthermore, the program load was the same as a full-time young adult. So for example, if a young student is studying a B, a B ed and they do eight modules for the year, the service teachers were expected to do the same. And then they are studying where the students are on, this, on vacation. And in fact, the facilities are during that time. So then that changes those results a little bit. Bigger picture. And you realize it's a program that's funded, it's a dog funded program. 
So there hasn't been any thinking about the additional support and about this nitty gritty time issues that the teachers were going to study for. It was just okay, it has a money to do the program, I think. And if you go, the, it's a realistically impossible task. We calculate that out. You need more than 85 hours a week. Can do that, except the, the solid waste workers in Gita Kwani doesn't make work 85 hours or 90 hours and pay for the time. It's 85 hours a week. But you know that this work was expecting from an ordinary teacher. I can pick a picture. Well, decisions about how donor funding is used for the purposes it was meant for. Actually, do the people who plan programs get we have to plan and how to decide how to allocate these resources and how to see the recipients, these poor teachers, in following all these programs. So you take the school study, wrap it in a bigger focus, wider, and then you, you can actually contribute an understanding to a bigger picture. Whereas I say, okay, these are the perceptions of the teachers. And so I find that it's important for us, and I think. Many people have mentioned very nicely, it's important to see where your research fits in and what you're going to say. So that's my point. My last thing, my other point. Okay. So I think you, um, Tony mentioned it briefly about when you're building up your impact, it's very important to review for journals. When journals ask you to be a reviewer, please pick up on it. The same way that you want to people to read your research, it's important for you to contribute to that academic part. And it also is a little bit selfish as you review. You, you can see in the article, you can actually see where your paper is putting in that one. The thing is, when you give you for an article, they have your details. And then sometimes if you give them information, it goes into a database. Some journals pick it up. When you submit to other journals, they have this record. When you're, if you submitted an article, uh, the reviewing the details, we pick up your profile about the as a reviewer. And it's kind of uh, improves your profile or it expands your profile on the top. So please, when you get that next invitation from a Jamster to review an article, please don't forget about it. That's one to me. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. And colleagues, uh, there's a call for uh, reviewers at uh, Jamste. Uh, please uh, take up those particular opportunities and uh, let's work and become impactful in this particular space. Uh, I'm going to allow Prof. Georgia at the end to make the commentary for all the presentations. Thank you so much for that input, uh, Prof. Bensila. Um, we are really learning how to become impactful in our research. Uh, let's allow uh, now uh, Dr. Najwa uh, Narodin uh, to come through. Uh, Dr. Narodin, I want you to speak to us about some of the skills and capabilities that researchers need uh, to actually demonstrate, um, you know, uh, in, in terms of their ability to become impactful. Uh, what are some of the skills and capabilities that one needs uh, to become um, an impactful researcher. You pointed out to me with regard to the question that you posed. So there's a big thing that I would like to highlight is that researchers need to show that they have expertise in an area of specialization. Think that, you know, as an academic, uh, especially, you know, when you start part of your PhD, post PhD, you really need to roll in your area of specialization. And you need to show that you understand like, the theories, methodologies, and the concepts, um, and, and focus in your area of specialization. I think, you know, some of us will be very distracted by a lot of issues. Come away. We need to be focused on one specific area of specialization. And this can be very difficult uh, in our context because in our higher education sector, we are faced with many challenges. 
um, such as last and long ago, COVID-19 was um, impacted in COVID-19. Um, it impacted our research focus, uh, but and our research questions. Um, also, student pre-test as well. Um, that also comes into to view any of our artificial intelligence and then also the impact of the economy um, uh, on the type of questions that we ask when we went to the research. So, so it, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to be focused, but we have to be aware of those uh, forces and external factors that impact on, on our research and we also have to be responsive to those uh, external factors. So, so this means that those societal factors, COVID-19, the economy, student protests, all of those factors influence the research we, we undertake and the choices we make in our research. So for me, uh, you know, coming from University of Technology, um, well, research must inform our higher education academy. Academy in the same time, the industries that we all come to. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, thank you. Yes, okay. we can still hear you. And official bodies, the crucial role in our um, research, in our community. So, so we are in the sense we have this relationship with them, and our research must inform them. Um, as well. I think that's quite a critical factor for us as UOTs. And then secondly, that we need to collaborate, and we've mentioned that uh, many times, we need to collaborate and we need to network. And those are crucial skills for researchers. Uh, uh, for us, um, in, in our context, in the South African context, we need to collaborate regionally. It's really useful to collaborate regionally with all the universities. And then we also need to collaborate nationally uh, so that we can build that research culture and disseminate the essential research debates and knowledge. That's really, we can't, you can't work alone as a researcher. That, that you never be in if you, uh, if you work alone. And then the third thing that I would like to, to uh, highlight is grant writing. I think that um, this is an essential skill as a researcher that you have to acquire. You must be able to write and require skills in hard writing and show the significance of your research and the potential impact of when you have seen with that grant. Uh, by developing skills in grant writing and accessing various funds, Additionally, there are funds that you can um, access as well as within institutions. Um, researchers can significantly, significantly build their careers if they start to write up grants and provide grants and so on. And at the same time, we can also secure our funds externally, um, internationally, and institutions that make these research, um, uh, uh, research grants available so that we can build our careers with uh, these grants. And I think that's quite essential. If, if you write a grant, you apply a grant, you don't have to do it individually. You can be a principal researcher and you can uh, do, uh, bring your team with you uh, when you uh, want to pull uh, those grants. And the last point I want to make about grants is that institutions must also make uh, that available for academics, you know, that within the institution, the capacity for academics to access that, those grants uh, must be very, very, very clear within the institution. Then um, the, the fourth thing that I'd like to mention is communication and the presentation of knowledge. So as researchers, we need to communicate our findings effectively with our academic audience, and we know very well how to do that via conferences, um, and, and in journals, when we publish in journals, high in, in, in journals, all the journals, South African journals, medical journals, international journals. And we also need to um, communicate with the not academic audience. And, and I, we've been touching on that a lot um, in this discussion. So the non academic audience would be our television or radio and in the 21st century, it's social media. So as a academic, we all need to have our social media accounts. We should have our Twitter, our 
face forward from telephones and clouds so that we can make the research available to our communities and to to um, and so that people can also um, read the what research we have undergone. Um, another that we should also not forget is our community involved. So we are academics at the institution, but we can also make a contribution in the community, present our knowledge in the community through our civic organizations, through our churches, through our mosques, or whatever community structures are out there in our um, organizations, in our cities, in our towns. We need to also consider how we as academics can make that available to our communities so that they stay with this um, complex things that happen in our communities. Um, and, and this also ensure that our research has a broader impact. Um, there are online newspapers like um, crime. Yeah, the newspapers of the conversation. I don't know if people are familiar with that. <laughs> um, as an academic, you can also make your research on value on platforms like that. Um, right? Uh, for newspapers, write articles for new newspapers. For instance, at the moment, uh, we're all very concerned with the level of literacy um, grade four that our grade four um, uh, learners have. So our academics must now write about that, drop to the newspapers, be on radio and um, be on television and, and provide an understanding to the community of that particular problem that we have. And in this way, we can be impactful while we leave. So in conclusion, the researcher should aim to address increasing social um, societal challenges by contributing to policy discussions, contributing to topical events, and also working on practical applications for the research ideas. I think that's also one of those means we can always um, remain in the theoretical um, domain with our research. Research also has to have a practical application. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much for that, uh, Dr. Uh, Fata. Uh, you know, it, it just took me back to Prof. Neta's point that uh, just publishing in high impact journals is not good enough. I, I, and I'm hearing it coming uh, from what you are saying, you know, uh, because we often focus on just uh, research publication in these high impact journals and forget about uh, pertinent things such as publishing in newspapers, uh, the media presence, social media presence. You know, these are some of the skills that for me are standing out and uh, they apply whether you are young or old. In the 21st century, we all need to have that social media presence and disseminate our research accordingly. Thank you so much for that particular input. Uh, I'm going to go over to Professor Aslam Fata. Uh, thank you so much for coming back, my good sir. Um, you know, I, I really wish I could apply for a grant that allows me to own all of you, like uh, put you in my house and they actually pay for you. And then you just teach me research and become impactful. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Prof. Aslam Fata, uh, please come through. What does research impact mean in the context of decolonization, Africanization of curriculum and pedagogy, as well as social in, uh, social transformation and equity? Um, colleagues, I'm going to uh, give you one or two points. I don't want to be named at a point for too long. I have, to the extent which I have listened to the uh, previous presenters, they provided an amazing platform for young scholars to uh, to understand how to do things of scholarship. Mm. I'm going to just uh, try to give an argument in a minute or two um, about it sits underneath all of us. Mm. What sits underneath all of this is your scholarly integrity. And your scholarly integrity is informed and framed by your normative commitments to life, to education, to research, and so on. So if you would have a commitment towards a decolonial orientation or an Africanizing orientation or a social justice orientation, or more than 
The question is, how does that impact your scholarly integrity in the way you hold your academic career? Because you may, on the one hand, choose to give effect to that kind of uh, 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 political, ideological, or normative commitment. Okay? But you may not do to yourself within the expected scholarly rigor that will allow you to know those very important uh, 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 conceptual anchors in your work to rigorous scholarship. So the question is, how do you take decoloniality, social justice, and organization up to rigorous scholarship? And in the first instance, it is not about publishing in community newspapers or appearing on TV or going out into the community and presenting yourself in public opinion. That is in the second and third and fourth instance, that is what I call the derivative. But the primary concern that an academic must have is what is the scholarly rigor that I provide for my normative commitments? And how do I establish that scholarly rigor? So that once I've established that scholarly rigor, now I can also play the secondary derivative role of becoming a public intellectual out in the public domain in the newspaper and so on. Remember? An academic cannot make noise in the newspapers. An academic cannot make noise on TV. And I think she has a special contribution to society. And that is to develop new knowledge, novel understanding, rigorous intellectual work, theoretically, work so that answers deep questions about society. And that requires that academic to recruit him or herself in the first instance into the scholarly rigor of his or her discipline. It requires to do hard work. It requires less and nice not to have it. It requires an individual commitment to engage with your own weaknesses, your weaknesses in the reading and writing and theory, and your own shortcomings, because the way you can to acknowledge those shortcomings and then to chase those are the gaps on those shortcomings so that you are able to understand what you have to do to become the best possible scholar that you can become. So don't have to rush too quickly to impact, have to rush too quickly to newspapers. Mm. That will come. What you have to do is to establish your scholarly rigor. Otherwise, decoloniality and recognition and social justice remains political, it remains some work, it remains without a scholarly base. Mm. So you have to make sure that you tick first box first, and that is to establish your scholarly integrity, your scholarly rigor, to the process of intellectual engagement with the work that went before. You become colonized, so you become, I was going to use a masculine term, you become on uh, the of the literature on which you stand, respect those who went before you. And then slowly but surely you develop your own voice and work out what intellectual contribution you are making, what scholarly contribution you are making. You can decide which journal you want to publish, whether it is a high impact journal, a low impact journal, and a community journal, a newspaper, and so on. That's besides the point. The point is, What's the, what is the scholarly voice that you are going to get yourself into and how are you going to uh, establish that scholarly voice so that you live with integrity, with integrity as a scholar uh, 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 and are able to make uh, a scholarly contributions that will take the society forward from the emerges the impact. Not developing a bifurcated understanding of impact. I'm not saying first this, then that, but I am in a sense saying that if scholarship and scholarly integrity and your development, if you all throw this game, then you, what are you? You, know, you shouldn't be at the university. Unless you be, what is the social purpose of the university? It's specialist disciplinary, rigorous scholarly knowledge earned by scholarship and people who are invested in that scholarship. Thank you very much. Sure, what a mouthful. Thank you so much for that, uh, Prof. And what is standing out for me is don't rush. You know, uh, we will be impactful. Uh, we, we, we're not supposed to rush. Let's uh, develop uh, the scholarly rigor and ensure that uh, we cement ourselves and people actually know what we're about. And that's how, uh, one way of becoming impactful. Thank you so much for that uh, insightful contribution. Thank you so much, Prof. Atta. Uh, now, colleagues, I'm going to allow you in a minute or so um, to just uh, give us your key takeaways uh, from 
anyone you can pick at any point that you want to elaborate on and briefly uh, we can go to any one of you who want to share any point any key takeaway that you may have from this particular discussion because for me uh, it, it's a lot it's it's more about ensuring that i take a step back and ensure that i develop that scholarly rigor that a prof Fata is talking about and ensuring that I don't only uh, publish in those high impact journals, but I am visible. Any key takeaway from anyone? I think you have said a mouthful. And like I said, you know, for me, I, I really wish I could have you in one room for at least a year. I wish there was that funding, uh, Prof Gasa, where you can actually apply to have people housed uh, in your own uh, house, and you can just go to room number one to just consult about uh, how do I ensure that I develop a scholarly rigor from Prof Fata, you know, and ensure that I understand the discourses of uh, not only publishing in high impact journals, but I I become visible. And then I will go to uh, door number two, which is uh, Prof Asian, you know. So I think we need to relook really also uh, issues of funding, uh, Prof, Prof, Prof Gas, in terms of how do we ensure that we actually house uh, all these professors in one room and they don't just uh, work in those institutions that they are housed in and they are available for one individual for a year and we see the impact that comes thereof. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, colleagues, uh, for this uh, lovely and insightful session. Uh, for me, I'm really rejuvenated and motivated to work even harder to become an impactful researcher. Thank you so much uh, to all our panelists. Uh, we don't take it for granted that uh, you're all joining us uh, from different parts of the world, uh, both in South Africa and internationally. We really uh, thank you for um, your availability uh, for this session. And we don't take for granted those contributions. They are recorded and we're going to make them available to those who may want to actually engage with the content. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, now I'm going to allow Pro. Uh, Zingi Swang Jojo uh, to give a commentary on the presentations, all the presentations. Um, this is the impactful corner. So Prof. Jojo is going to show us how it's done at UNISA in terms of responding to all these panelists' uh, discussion. Thank you, Prof. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Zingi. Thank you very much, to the moderator. Next to me, I actually, I feel, I feel younger than 40, but I stand here. And I think that's the attitude of the whole, uh, the whole room. Um, and uh, in responding to the focus discussion session posed on the topic, jungling between academic and real world impact, the panelists responded from different angles as we can all attest. And without repeating everything they deliberated on, Mine is to comment on their submissions in this panel discussion. And I promise to do that within the 10 minutes that was allocated to me. And given the fact that there were seven people, so it means for each person, I can only talk for one and a half uh, minutes in trying to comment and summarize what the people were saying and what I took from that. And I was out wasting any time, I'll start off with uh, Prof. Yasmin Abdahi, uh, who was taking us on some of the pathways to impact on research mentioned. And uh, he spoke about the fact that impact is more than academic impact. And it's, uh, it also takes into consideration capacity building, social impact, policy formation, and it should inform practice. Uh, he stressed on that because just writing, and putting your, your research out there, which does not have anything to do with the practice itself. For example, if you're writing on, on pedagogy that teachers should follow, we should see changes in the classroom. And that for me would be um, the, the, an impact, a clear one that is practical. Uh, she also mentioned something like a potential for social impact. Think about theory, the techniques and methods uh, you are using 
training other researchers, which will increase your research skills. And uh, on that note, commended very much this uh, collaboration that has started in our SEDU college, where our young ones, I'm sorry to call you young ones, where our young academics have come together. And you, I think we can all feel the heat. They, they, they are on the road, they, they are moving, and they are, what is very important for me, they, they, all these panels, they stress the fact that you cannot work alone. You need to hold each other's hands. And, and, the, and the, I'm very delightful also that the young academics are also including those people that are working towards P, their PhD, because there are various in, instances where you just, uh, you know, the comments that you get from your supervisor, they nauseate you, you take that thing and you throw it away and you're like, why am I frustrating myself this much? I could as, as well, you know, I've got my master's, I might as well, you know, yeah. But uh, just to summarize what she said, she, she said it's very important to disseminate your research through community that you're talking to. Have a specific audience and a specific time and what those people can do with that kind, those kinds of results that you had from your, from your research. And uh, she stressed also that uh, you you need to to talk to the be very much aware of the uh, Millennium Goals, the UN Sustainable Goals, um, and, and what can you make an impact on? And she said there are about twenty one of them, but list uh, look at that list and look. Uh, she referred specifically to number four, but I think you can look at many of the others like if you if most of the time when you are reading uh, articles and you are listening to things then the justice uh, that affects uh, the way in which teaching is done or or whatever you, you know your instincts then i think you can dwell much on that side moving on to prof Bansalal, who agreed that uh, the context matters in planning, capturing, communicating, and monitoring uh, one's research. She, she said, do not focus on small, picture, on small pictures where this is uh, as little research. Uh, look at a bigger space, a bigger picture. This small research that you're doing, where does it contribute? What is the significance of your study? What is the new knowledge that you want to bring about? What is this? catching thing that will make uh, an impact or people or change the way people think about how they do research. Um, allow yourself to contribute to academic space by doing uh, reviewing. She stressed on that. So colleagues, don't forget to accept reviews. That is actually where you learn from. You learn from how other people are addressing other topics and how they express themselves. Why is your critique? Critiquing, you are also looking at, and then you are also uh, unawareingly learning of how these things are done. So, um, and she actually stressed that that uh, actually builds your profile, and uh, so take those spaces and use them. Prof. Essen responding to whether there is something else that researchers need to do after publishing in high impact journals, highlighted that for him. There are at least two benefits of publishing uh, in the fact that it increases one's citations, yeah, you get more recognized in one's field and get invited uh, in to uh, give seminars in one's field. And I'm thinking that um, it was Jean Piaget who looked at uh, the developmental stages and uh, picked on that and elaborated on that and made that his space. And now today, most of the time, if you're talking about development uh, stages of, of learning, you have to uh, uh, refer to Jean Piaget. It was Van Hille who spoke about uh, stages of uh, geometry learning and all that kind of thing. And I want to think that there is uh, some spheres that we can tap into our own African theories, our Ubuntu, our own philosophies and make them known. But then as an academic, which is what came out very strongly, you need to be an expert 
focus on a particular uh, topic and that you are fond of and expand and elaborate on that, then you will have an impact. Actually, people will refer to you. They will go and read your work when they want to elaborate on that. So uh, Prof. Essen said, uh, make yourself known and be visible in conferences by joining special interest groups and networks. Special interest groups, they come very much um, as a, what uh, a Lave Wenga calls communities of practice. Now, they formulated theirs internationally. We can formulate ours locally. And I think what our young uh, academics are doing here is kind of a community of practice because that they've created a space where they are now going to um, uh, learn from each other on how to approach, for example, rejection of a, of a, of a, of a journal article. They, they, you know, you, you get set. And the rejection is coming perhaps after three, three years or so, and you thought it was the best of yours. So, so those are the spaces. Uh, use, okay, thank you. Use ResearchGate, Academia, and upload your publications on social media platforms like Facebook, Instagram, and others, Twitter. So let's tweet about educational contributions that we can make. Let's have those conversations. Let's, uh, because even the community that, now, that we now can impact on, which is our young ones, our teachers, our everybody, they are on that social media. So can we cloud that uh, uh, social media so that each time they get, the, oh, there's this conversation about this uh, discipline and it's going on and we let each other uh, uh, comment on that. So then in that case, uh, the young academics and the middle ones and the older ones, they will find people of their own disciplines, of their own interests that are always commenting on what you are posting. And then you can take it from there and be a what you, a, a, a what you call it. Actively involve yourself. Collaborations, I won't say that anymore. It came true uh, out very, uh, very widely from all the panel members. And uh, what stood out for me for, from um, uh, Prof. Essen was him saying, it's not about how many articles, but what are you making? What impact are you making when you publish? And this reminds me also of a visit that we had from our prominent uh, professor. X. Uh, remember, I come from the maths education. We use X and Y. Professor X, he came to our department and he was trying, she was trying, she, she was trying to motivate us on how to do publications. It was very much at our earlier um, uh, spheres of uh, academia. And she said, if you publish in high impact journals, my, my, my moderator, you don't have to publish many articles. Three is enough. They will know what you're saying and they will keep referring to that. And, and as such, that is how you, you get into the national and the international world. And most people will be citing you and your age and index will, we, we heard about the age index, it will go up and, and so forth. So it's not about the, how many citations you're having, who is citing you as opposed to how many people are reading your work? Is anybody reading your work? Or, 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 or. get out and be part of the, uh, uh, the appropriate uh, community. I'm moving to Prof. Uh, Aslan Fata, who was responding on what does research impact mean in the context of decolonization, Africanization, social transformation, and equity. And, uh, he, he, he just came in and said, in my two minutes, I'm finishing up my uh, program director. What sits underneath all of this is one scholarly integrity in the one uh, you build your academic, in the, in the way in which you build your academic scholarship. And he is saying it must be a rigorous one. And you need to go and read perhaps what is scholarly rigor. How can I publish? What, I, what I'm doing. And he, he, he stressed the fact that your mandate as an academic is to develop new knowledge. And this requires commitment, understanding of your own shortcomings, establishing your own scholarly record, and uh, making your contribution. And you live within integrity, 
you don't plagiarize, and that will take the society forward. And he said, warned us not to rush. And uh, when that scholarly rigor, which is what professors will tell you, when that scholarly rigor has been built or developed, you can then shoot for the high impact channels. You can now go uh, to televisions to make comments because you're talking about something that you're sure of you have uh, where to go. Lastly, I want to, oh, no, not lastly. I want to just take one um, uh, point that was uh, raised by Dr. Nadra Fata on some skills and capabilities to demonstrate ability to create impact, to become central to careers, progressions, and institutional reputation. She mentioned the tension between research and attitude, and that research should inform or evoke debates around policy in both academic and non-academic space. So it's not just your writing, it's not just your research, but are we able to talk about what you are doing? Uh, I'll, I'll make some one, 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 what you call. Are you talking to uh, women that are underrepresented in the science and STEM and whatever, which is something that can, you know, you can debate out. Is, is there something that can be said, or are you looking at the failure rate that somebody has uh, has looked for, uh, looked at? Everybody's failing mess, and you are you are looking at that also, and you are, you are also failing the mess yourself as you are looking at that. Uh, so, but she also stressed on grant writing on how to access the funds in your institutions nationally and internationally. And how does this uh, uh, impact on your research? Right, getting grants, getting funding, it allows you to then be able to attend these conferences, to get into the national and international space, to share what you are thinking, and to then get into networking, collaborations, and, and many other, and actually to open your eyes very much uh, wider. Lastly, program director, I want to talk uh, to what uh, Prof. Luneta said on assessment of research impact that focuses too much on academic impact, whereas indicators of change in the real world. And he focused mainly on how research can increase their impact uh, potential beyond academia. And in so doing, he said, how does one increase uh, impact other than publishing? And, and uh, he spoke to that academic uh, success is achieved through hardworking. This is coming again. That hardworking, remember, is coming with commitment, okay? And it's actually coming from me now, sacrifice, where you leave out many of the things. You don't attend all the funerals. You can go, I'm so, sorry. I'm sorry to make it something like that. But, but as an academic, really, you have to discern and and they, and they know why you are going to that party. What is it for you in the party itself, other than the dancing? Because you can dance in your room anyway, anytime. Um, academic success is achieved through hardworking, standing out in one's field. What is your age index? How are you represented on Google Scholar Scopus? Uh, you must push academic. That is how you push your academic uh, impact. But then he actually scrutinized the fact that these high impact journals, who actually reads them? Uh, as said, we are mandated to train our teachers, to empower our teachers, to, to, to make sure that teachers are in a space where they can change the, the knowledge or, or contribute to the knowledge of our learners. So now in those high impact journals and actually in any journal, even if it's not high impact, teachers have got nothing to do with it. So then in that case, there is community engagement where you can do professional development as a young academic, you grow in that space, you, they will tell you what they need, their needs are, and then you go into that space and you, you, you involve yourself there. In finishing, I wish to say, perhaps if you engage and interact with audiences that uh, like 
policy makers, industry, educators, health practitioners, economists, and everybody else, maybe your research will have an, an, an impact. And if, if perhaps there is change, you need to be thinking about the change that you want to create in the process of the, the, the writing. What, what is the kind of uh, uh, change that you want to, to create? And uh, lastly, it's very much important to remember that you can run a workshop, you can produce a report, you can meet companies, you can get, get uh, grants and all that, but if there is no transformation, I'm not sure if your research has impact. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Jojo, and all the panelists, and to you colleagues uh, who attended virtually and in person. Thank you so much for being patient in this session. Uh, Prof. Jojo, you just made, made the list, okay? In my uh, grant application, I'm going to also include you as one of those who are going to be housed in my house for a year to share that knowledge. Thank you so much, uh, colleagues. I, I, I really learned a lot. And my key takeaways uh, from this session is that, yeah, let's work. And with that said, thank you so much for being patient with me and being patient with our panelists. Thanks so much for for your time. Uh, that brings us to the end of this session. We're not going to take any questions because we believe that the presentations were impactful. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm ending it back to our program director who's going to give us a few announcements as to how we can go about after lunch. Ticks. Thank you, buddy. That was a very insightful panel discussion. Lots was said, nothing left to summarize. So we're going to move on to the next item, which should be lunch. Because we are streaming online and we are also in the building, we are not going to take up too much time as we are in person. Please, can we go to the ZK Matthews building where we'll collect our lunch? And then if we can kindly come back into this room in the Senate Hall to eat our lunch while we proceed with the second panel discussion. So we will be back here in the next 15 minutes and online as well. We'll be back in 15 minutes. So you can also have a 15 minute lunch break at home, go make a cup of coffee, grab something to eat, and then we'll be back in 15 minutes. Thank you so much. At court, at five past one.
Miss Ramoluma Rams. She's going to come to the stage and moderate our second panel discussion. Over to you. Can we please give her a warm round of applause? Thank you so much, Tix. Sunny Bonani, Sunny Bonani, Sunny Bonani. And to all the colleagues at home, uh, welcome to our second session. Um, this is our second panel discussion, and we will be talking to our young ones. So the second discussion is based on being an emerging and developing researcher in the artificial age. In, in the artificial intelligence age. As uh, Dr. Tukozani has said, my name is Mulewuheng Ramulumo. And for those that are under the age of 40, you can call me Rams. And if you are above 40, I am Mulewuheng Ramulumo. <laughs> so I'm going to introduce our panelists. And as I call you, please come to the stage and then you can just sit next to me. Okay, what's happening? Oh, okay. So our first panelist is Dr. Nati Songozi, and he will be talking about ethical considerations in the use of artificial intelligence for research purposes. Our second panelist is Dr. Patricia Foto, and as a frequent user of artificial intelligence, she will be addressing the limitations of artificial intelligence, challenges, and opportunities. And then our last panelist is Ms. Christy Kotsia. She will be addressing the strategies for upholding student honesty and integrity in the era of artificial intelligence. So colleagues, this is how our program will run. We'll have our three panelists presenting their presentations, and then we'll have a moderated discussion. Then we'll open the floor for question and answer and then at the end, we have Dr. Mazibe to do the commentary. Are we ready? Okay, before we start, just to ease the nerves, I'm just going to ask that you answer this from your chairs. Can we get mics, please, for them? Okay, so this is Youth Day. This is us. We are here and we have arrived. So, yeah, Doctor, when I gave you this topic, be honest, what came into mind? Um, remember, this is a safe space. Only like a million people are watching you. So, yeah, be very honest how you felt about this. And, yeah, just to ease the nerves. When you gave me this topic, yes. yes, you are asking me how I felt when you gave me this specific topic two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, was it two weeks ago? <laughs> okay, no, it's fine. Well, yeah, it was a bit challenging, but I said, you know what. Let me go and tell them how I feel about this artificial intelligence. And I think you'll get answers when I do my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Foto, the same question. Thank you, Chair. I think with me, I was very surprised because I was like, I'm a life science teacher. Why am I talking about AI? I was very shocked. But I was like, since I'm always on social media, maybe I should have a discussion today. So you will hear what we'll talk about. And then lastly, Ms. Uh, Kutsia. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think I share the sentiments um, with the others. I, this is not my field of specialization. I am an economics teacher, but I was so excited to learn and to embrace this opportunity to, to discuss with the group today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And remember, we gave them the uh, topics two weeks ago. I emphasize in two weeks. So they've had time to prepare. 
So uh, without wasting any time, we'll start with uh, Dr. Nati, who will be talking about ethical considerations in the use of artificial intelligence for research purposes. Can we just please give him a hand? Please excuse me, I'm still trying to project. Uh, thank you, program director and the session moderator. Uh, I must just declare that I've got only a few slides. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if my eight slides will be sufficient uh, to make the most of my 10 minutes that has been allocated. But given the fact that SEDU is the biggest, one of the biggest colleges at UNISA, and the fact that UNISA is the largest African university shaping features in the service of community, Perhaps I will spend my first five minutes observing the protocol. I'm trying to, to make sure that I exhaust my 10 minutes. <laughs> artificial intelligence. Um, artificial intelligence um, is the capacity of computers to carry out tasks that typically require human intelligence. However, in my opinion, one cannot meaningfully discuss ethical issues surrounding the use of artificial intelligence in research without first questioning the existence of the technology and its significance to education. Good afternoon, colleagues. Now, I believe for the purpose of Tackling this particular topic, it is important to first understand artificial intelligence or the era of artificial intelligence in conjunction with other imperatives. While these artificial intelligence technologies are regarded as disruptive innovations, without illuminating context, one cannot provide any meaningful account for its significance to higher education research. Therefore, it is against the background of context as the interrelated conditions in which something exists or occurs that compels us to begin by understanding the policy context of higher education. The various human rights and education related treaties, which serves as a gateway connecting artificial intelligence and accessible quality higher education and research. These global imperatives are domesticated through various South African higher education policies and legislations to transform the sector, reduce inequalities, and improve access to education. These include uh, the constitution, which in terms of the Bill of Rights, reaffirms everyone's right to quality education, which the state through appropriate methods should make progressively available. Therefore, it comes as no surprise that expanding access, improving quality and increasing diversity feature as main objectives of the higher education policies of South Africa. And <clears throat> the African region. In order to serve the country more broadly, these policies recognize a need for more places for people to learn, more types of courses and qualifications, more financial support for students and better quality education, training, and upskilling. 
Now, having uncovered the contextual background explaining the importance of artificial intelligence on social justice and redress, what are some of its benefits to higher education researchers? The machine learning models use big data to learn and improve predictability and performance automatically through experience and data without being programmed to do so by humans. The stats IQ, for instance, enables everyone from beginners to expect researchers to uncover meaning in data, identify trends, and produce predictive models without spending days in SPSS and Excel. And for this, you normally don't need prior training. One can also use text analysis to break these massive amounts of data into sentences, phrases, and keywords, allowing you to better understand the trends and topics present across your files. Through artificial intelligence, researchers can also rewrite papers or paraphrase paragraphs without having to engage much with the literature. So these are some of the benefits that, depending on the standards that you've set for yourselves, come with artificial intelligence. We know that every change comes with its challenges, be it resistance to change or struggling to adjust to the changing environment. However, with regards to artificial intelligence and research, the matter of ethical consideration needs to be preceded by problematizing the existence of artificial intelligence or its potential threat towards good scholarly practice. While these artificial intelligence tools are central to education transformation, we also need to acknowledge that they promote cheating. The writing completed with internet access can potentially include material that is written by artificial intelligence rather than by the student or the researcher. Now, this is despite ethical requirements for researchers to be honest in respect of their own actions in research and in the actions or, or in their responses to the actions of others. Now, if the tool is doing their work, the researcher is not developing any thinking skills and it becomes challenging now to assess their understanding and application of the content. While we embrace artificial intelligence, we also need to acknowledge that to a certain extent, it promotes isolation, detachment, insensitivity, and absence of Ubuntu. One of the main advantages of artificial intelligence language model is that they provide a platform for asynchronous communication. Now, this feature, has been found to increase engagement and collaboration, and it allows discussion of topics without having to be present at the same time. However, from a research perspective, such insensitivity may result in being uncaring and detached to the emotional well being of others, and thus increase the likelihood for research ethics violation. Another danger is that the dishonesty and immorality related to the use of artificial intelligence in higher education research may extend beyond masters and doctoral students to involve supervisors, colleges, and institutions of higher learning. This is said against the pressures towards universities need to increase their research output and student throughput, which in some countries determine the government subsidy. The pressures to improve the average of full-time equivalent researchers, the need for academic promotion and incentives, the need to realize the 2020 agenda of 
producing 100 PhDs per million by the year 2030, and the need to ensure the continuity of the next generation of scholars. So basically no one is exonerated. We all have the potential of violating the ethical code of conduct, especially when artificial intelligence is involved. So no one is safe. Zigul out speak. There's, a, there's definitely a need to review relevant policies in a manner that recognizes ethics and integrity as the honest, fair, and responsible research and tuition associated with honesty, truth, equity, respect, responsibility, accountability amidst this era of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence tools can be incredibly powerful, but they also have their own limitations. Researchers should understand the capabilities of artificial intelligence tools that they are using and be aware of their potential biases or errors that may arise while using these tools. They should also double check the output of artificial intelligence tools and verify their accuracy before using them in their work. Moreover, while these tools can be useful, they should not be used as a replacement for critical thinking and analysis. Researchers should use artificial intelligence tools as a supplement to their own research and writing rather than relying on them entirely. Sound methodology and scientific validity are the entry point of ethical research. Engaging in research that has fundamental flaws in design and methodology is a waste of human, financial, and other resources. When assessed against a research philosophy that incorporates ontology, epistemology, and methodology, Artificial intelligence-based research cannot generate actual events, embrace a wide interpretivist epistemology that recognizes social reality, and thus maintains a biased view about what constitutes truth and reality. Now, in concluding and uh, taking into account the issues that we have discussed uh, earlier and the novel nature of most artificial intelligence tools, especially in the South African higher education context. More studies are needed to better understand the research ethical implications of this particular phenomenon. We also need to adopt an ecological system approach in a manner that should acknowledge the role of every party in the discourse to better understand how artificial intelligence-based uh, practices or artificial intelligence research-based practices affect them or can be improved. These parties may be our students, the supervisors, the institutions, the communities which are normally subjects of our research and policy make makers because at the end of the day, the ecological system is a system of interrelated parts which together serve to form a whole. So this is something that needs to be discussed from a macro level, micro level, and the meso level. With that being said, Nahailal. Thank you.
Good afternoon, colleagues. I hope you can all hear me because I'm very short, so it is what it is. It's the problem of short people, sir. So colleagues, um, I'm Patricia Porto, but I normally tell my colleagues to call me Cha. I don't like it. Or you can call me Larato. So colleagues, today I'm going to leave you with more questions than answers. So when I'm done, you'll have more questions than answers. That's the whole point of the presentation. I'll be talking, I'll be addressing the limitations of AI. I'll be talking about the challenges and the opportunities. But as I said, my point is to leave you with questions. Look at the statement. 50% of AI researchers believe that there is a 10% or even a greater chance that human go extinct from our inability to control AI. Please take it in. This was said by open AI researchers. They said 50% of AI researchers believe that there's a 10% or even a greater chance that humans go extinct from our inability to control AI. It's moving. Let me even give you a better picture. Maybe you'll get it like this. Good one. So now we love traveling with our airplane. So imagine if you were told that there's a 50% chance that 50% or even a greater chance that you will die when you get on an airplane. This is related to a statement that I just said. It's sinking in. Eh? Okay. What we should know about technology is that technology comes with three rules. The first rule is that when you invent new technology, you uncover a new class of responsibilities. But you are not told what those responsibilities are. They just give you technology and they say, yeah, go with it, move with it. But you are not told of what those responsibilities are. We have to figure them out ourselves. Second rule, if technology converts power, it starts a race. The moment we give technology a power, the moment technology has power, it starts racing because we have granted it power. That rule, if you do not coordinate technology, the race ends in tragedy. If we are unable to control it, it's gonna end in tragedy and it has already has. What do I mean? The social dilemma. Social media is a dilemma. We are already in tragedy. Mm -hmm. The first contact human came with AI, it was through social media. Social media was the first time humans came in contact with AI. For example, when you open TikTok, because I know majority of us do have TikTok, I do. When you open TikTok and you scroll using, using your fingers, you are activating AI. And it goes where? It activates your brain and it activates your nervous system. It says, yeah, scroll, next one, next video. This one is beautiful. You are activating it. Okay. Still with me? Yeah, yeah. So now, a very simple technology has break humanity. That's what I'm telling you today. A very simple technology, it has break humanity. You are scrolling addiction, and we don't even want to admit Dumb scrolling. People are not sleeping under the blankets. People are busy scrolling. You know yourselves. Okay. Influencer culture. There's a new career. They call it influencing now. It comes with technology. Influencer culture. Fake news. How many times have we heard that somebody has died? And then you find out, oh, sorry. It was a joke or it was a lie. Fake news. We are bombarded with fake news because of a small AI. And nobody intended for this to happen. Engineers, they only wanted to, make, to maximize engagement. They said, no, we just want to maximize engagement. They didn't intend for this to happen. But you know what? It has happened. So in the first AI, as I said, humanity has lost. We have lost. How could we have lost? Somebody may ask, but how could we have lost? Because the paradigm of social media was to give everyone a voice. Social media was created because they wanted to give everyone a voice. 
to connect people. In our previous section, they talk that you need to connect. You need to uh, be active on your social media. You need to let people know. You see, it's moving. We are giving it power. You need to join like-minded communities. We need to enable small businesses to reach customers. This was the paradigm that came with AI, right? Okay, Asambi. <laughs> with all this positiveness of AI, there is a little creepy face. With all the positiveness that comes with AI, there's a little creepy face. What is that little creepy face? Comes with addiction, information overload, as I have stated, right? It's not there. It doesn't end there. Behind that creepy face, there's even a bigger monster. We're just looking at those small things. We are conversing now. There's their addiction. That's just a small one. There's even a bigger monster. What is a bigger monster? Our society has changed. AI has rewrote society, has rewrote what we knew was reality with society. Children identity. Right now, if you're a teenager, you don't have a Snapchat, ooh, you are socially excluded. If you don't have Instagram, you don't exist. If you are not on WhatsApp, where are you? Our reality has changed. <laughs> has changed. We even now call each other via WhatsApp. We don't put a time anymore. We just buy data. Our reality has changed because of social media. We are busy conversing about the small things of social of, of that came with social media, but there is more monster behind that. Our reality has changed. Media journalism. If it's not on media, then that journalism is not true. Politics and, 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 and um, elections, they are now done on social media. If there's a party that is not on social media, I don't know it. It has to be on social media for me to know it. So we have lost in our first contact. Right now, we are in the second contact. The second contact where human being came with AI, it is shared GPT-3. But my question is, have we solved the first dilemma of social media? Have we solved it? Mm -mm. But now we are in the second contact. Hey. Okay. As I said right now, we are in the second contact, which is shared GPT-3, but it comes with beautiful things, right? Even my, my first panelist was here explaining all the good things it comes with. It makes us more efficient. It makes us write faster. Guys, we are told to write articles. We are getting rejects left and right. But do not worry, AI is there to make you write faster. That's a positive thing, right? Okay. It makes us code faster. It solves the impossible scientific challenges. And it makes us a lot of money. I could sit here and tell you about all the lot of money that it, it comes with. La Lela. Behind a beautiful shared DPT3, there is a small monster. And the small monster is the one that we are engaging in. What is that? Yes, AI is biased. Meaning whoever ad updated AI, if the person was biased, it means the AI that we are using is biased. AI is taking our jobs. I don't have to pay a, a transcriber now to transcribe an interview of a different language. I can do that via AI tools. AI is transparency. You know, our, our most of the scholars, they speak about, well, if you use chat GPT-3, you must ensure that in your methodology, you write that you have used chat GPT-3. You see, it comes with those challenges. Uh, AI is acting creepy. We do feel like it's acting creepy because it can do everything. But let me tell you something. We are discussing right there, right? But behind that small monster that we are busy discussing about, there is even a bigger monster. Bigger one. We are busy discussing this small monster. But there's a bigger one. And what is that? Reality collapse. Our reality is collapsing right now. When you write an article, you know that you go on Google Scholar, you download articles, you read about them, and then you start writing. Now I don't have to do that. I just take those articles, go to share GPT-4, not even three, go to share GPT-4, take those articles, put them there, and say, share GPT-4, please explain to me what are these articles all about. It will summarize them for me. Reality is collapsing. Number two, fake everything. Now everything is fake. We don't know what's right or what's wrong. 
if people are publishing, we don't know, is this their own work? Is this, is this chat GPT-3, 4? There's five on the way. Hey, fake. Everything is now fake. Trust is collapsing. Yeah. Editors, they don't know what to trust anymore. Is this person a good writer? Or is this person using AI and they are smart about it? Our reality is collapsing. And we are busy convincing about the small part. Hmm, I told you, I'm going to leave you with more questions than answers today. Are we losing again? We have already lost the social media dilemma. Are we losing again now? Our second contact with AI, are we losing? Hmm. So what I'm going to say to you today is that AI is moving fast. AI experts who are familiar with exponential curves cannot predict anymore. Even the expert of AI, they can't say, well, in the next coming year, maybe or two, this is what AI will be doing. Ah, uh -uh. they can't predict it anymore. Ngiabong. No, I've got my back on nothing. Did it start projecting? No. I'm Can you project it? <laughs> Doc, now I have to follow that. Yo. <laughs> Goodness, both of these panelists that went before me. Goodness. <laughs> Because then I can show the notes here. Yeah. That's not my thing. There we go. Good afternoon, everybody. So um, I think one of the main ways that I try to rationalize something that I don't necessarily understand is I try to find a way to explain it to my six-year-old. And she's clever, but not that clever. And um, one of the ways that while doing my research in the two weeks that Rams gave me to prepare for this presentation um, was to try and figure out what exactly AI is, because I'm an EMS teacher, as we mentioned at first, and not just what AI is, but what impact it has on us. So um, what I figured out was a big AI like chat GPT that is all the rage at the moment is actually a tool that predicts what should be said next. It cannot think, it cannot critically evaluate. Chat GPT is just a really good prediction tool. It, however, does have a very vast language. So what Chat GPT does is it goes over 75 million parameters and finds information that best suits the words that you're putting into it. So if you put common words like lesson plan into it, it's going to very easily design a lesson plan. So this AI, this chat GPT can, again, it can be a friend, it can be an enemy. We need to decide how we're going to embrace it. And um, I've heard now from my colleagues that it can be really, really scary, but it's here. And 
what, what um, Dr. Foto was also saying was that technology is a race and it runs much faster than we can. We just need to try and keep up. Okay, so Valente, De Luca, and Klinger have suggested the following diagram to illustrate the relationship between artificial intelligence. Oh, hot. <laughs> I'm sorry, thank you. Which button is it push? Which one? Oh, I think this one. There we go. Okay. So they suggested the following diagram that shows the relationship between artificial intelligence, academic integrity, and assessment principles. And as you can see, there's that tiny little sweet spot in the middle that we're still looking for, that we haven't found yet. But I think we need to keep in mind that artificial intelligence is not new. Google has been able to suggest the end of our sentences for years. I have been speaking to Siri in the morning, asking her what the weather is, or we've been speaking to Alexa. Um, social media has artificial intelligence that monitors where we're driving, who we're speaking to, what we look at a little bit longer on social media. Artificial intelligence is not new. It's been around for many years. GPT, GPT-3, and now Chat GPT is the newest version, but GPT and GPT-3 are really old. Not really old, but they've been around for a couple of years. So the attention that ChatGPT is gaining is due to its sophisticated language and the fact that it is widely available and it's really user-friendly. You can write an entire essay from your phone. I have heard that doctoral students are able to write an entire dissertation. Oh, good. I must try that. Maybe I'll finish faster. <laughs> um, so then um, next, academic integrity is also not new. Problems with academic integrity has been around since universities and schools have existed. Um, we also need to remember that even in the olden days, I'm talking about 2019 or before that, we had to have in <laughs> we had to have invigilators, invigilating sessions to ensure academic integrity. Students didn't show up to an empty venue and just be honest and do the right thing. We have to have our postgrad dissertations and theses going through turn it in. Academic integrity is not a new concept, it's not a new battle. And assessment principles. We need to um, align, our university needs to align the assessment principles and policies to mirror change. Unfortunately, as we know, policy change takes really long and technology is this race and we are not keeping up. So we need to find the sweet spot between artificial intelligence, academic integrity, and our assessment principles to enhance learning and to give our students the best chance in our current climate, in our current world. How can we give them the best chance with the tools that they have? So very briefly, the evolution of academic dishonesty, it's not a new thing. Not that long ago in 1998, we had students it would go onto the internet, copy and paste. And if you look, it's gone all the way up to, now the newest is our AI generated writing. And what I'm saying by this is not using chat GPT or AI as a tool, because that could have a lot of potential, a lot of benefits as the panelists have mentioned. But putting something into chat GPT or into an AI, copying and pasting it and producing it as your own. That is a form of academic dishonesty. And I believe that the people that have gone before us have been fighting this good fight since 1998, trying to find out, or before, much, you know, long before that, trying to find out what are we going to do with this new technology to try and ensure um, academic integrity. So um, when this committee asked me to participate in this discussion, I was very nervous, actually a little bit reluctant. I think Rams is just very charming. And um, because academic integrity is not my field, but actually it is. Students' integrity is not my field, but actually it is. I am a PhD student, I am a lecturer, I am an emerging scholar, and each and every one of our developed scholars this is our field, and if it isn't, it should become our field. We need to attend workshops. We need to figure out what is going on with this AI, how is it prevalent in our modules, and also how we can use it. It's not going anywhere. It is only going to get bigger, smarter, more sophisticated. We need to try and keep up with 
the, the change. So I asked ChatGPT, I put into one of my continuous assessments is for to ask my students to write a lesson plan in EMS. And um, I put that into ChatGPT and I was honestly shocked at the beautiful lesson plan it gave me. It had the um, our action verbs, our blooms from easier to most more complicated. It even gave time frames per section of the lesson. And it even asked the students real world engagement. This is brilliant. This is something that we could actually use to our benefit if we can do it honestly and ethically. I think that is the key here is honesty and ethics. So then what I asked ChatGPT to do next is, okay, but design a lesson plan for learners with hearing disabilities. And again, it gave me this beautiful response of a lesson plan in detail, the introduction, the body, the conclusion, real world applications for supply and demand for my grade nines in my EMS class for learners with hearing disabilities. Again, we can see AI as an enemy or we can see it as a friend, a uh, frenemy, probably both, but we need to try and embrace it. And I think that when I first started teaching, I was shocked. I was floored by the amount of other work there was and I had to do lesson plans at night. Couldn't this have helped me? Couldn't I have used this? And again, honestly and ethically, use this lesson plan and built upon it for my own classroom in my context for the learners in my class. Could that not have actually benefited our learners? Okay, let's quickly. So very quickly before I move on, I think that when we're deciding, should we embrace or reject artificial intelligence? Should we try and resist it? We need to look at who are we teaching and what are we preparing them for? We are teaching the teachers of the fourth industrial revolution. Our very own Prof. Marque and Prof. Gaza always tell us, you're not training the teachers of next year. You're training the teachers of four years or five years from now. And we need to make sure that those teachers are entering the fourth industrial revolution classroom. Then I found myself thinking, but the majority of our South African classrooms don't have laptops and they don't have whiteboards, but they could. Here is an example of a school in a rural community. It is a no-fee school in a rural community. When COVID came, they realized that the old Model C schools were able to continue teaching, but they couldn't. So they made a plan, they found funding, and they built a few AI classrooms. Here's a picture of it. Again, this is at a no-fee school in a rural area. If they can do it, many other schools can. Are we preparing our teachers to teach in the classroom above? Or are we preparing them to teach in the classroom below? And what role does AI and embracing technology and AI play in it? Okay, so very briefly, as I, can I, I, sorry, I'm so sorry. Okay, very briefly, um, I think that while we're in this very awkward phase between knowing what is written fully by artificial intelligence, what our students are using as a learning aid, what we as emerging researchers are using, we can maybe have a meeting with our markers, also have a meeting with our students, and look at some of these key aspects at identifying artificial intelligence, fully generated artificial intelligence text. So you will notice the text is often wordy, although I get that all the time that I'm wordy, but the text is often wordy. Then sesquipedalian, I had to Google it, also how to pronounce it. If you see a word like that, it actually means using big words unnecessarily. It's probably also AI generated if you have to Google it and Google how to pronounce it. Often AI will produce repetitive phrases and patterns and it has a lack of human emotion and experiences. Hyperbole or contrasting ideas, you will notice that in one paragraph, it's entirely different from the next paragraph. This is because again, it's gone to search 75 million parameters to find different ideas that match your word of lesson plan. So of course it will find contrasting ideas. And of course, the context is not specific to South Africa. AI cannot think the way a human can. It lacks insight. And um, it also alternates between British and American English. So in the one sentence, the student will spell behavior without a U. And in the next sentence, they will spell behavior with a U. And um, then also, 
you will be able to use tools such as copy leaks. I wanted to go into it, but I don't think I have time. Please go play around. There are many AI detection tools, but copy leaks allows you to copy a part of text, post it into it, and then it will tell you, is this human or AI generated? So perhaps if you see a bunch of these red flags popping up from your students, or you know, as, as me as an emerging researcher, go into one of these tools and test it perhaps. Okay, last one, I promise. Um, all right, so strategies for upholding students' honesty and integrity in an era of artificial intelligence. Again, this is not students' honesty and integrity. It's not a new topic. This is something that has been around for generations. So what can we try to do to help our students and ourselves as emerging researchers? The list is still um, ever developing, but some of the literature that I came across was the university needs to be specific and improve our assessment standards because I'm not 100% sure how I will punish a student for something that has been generated by AI because it's so difficult to pick up the plagiarism. 75 million data sources. Yeah. Turnitin is not going to pick it up as plagiarized as easily because it's bits and pieces from 75 million spaces. Then um, educating our emerging researchers and our students on AI on AI, instead of pretending like it doesn't exist and like it's horrible, let's have meetings, go to our students and say, look, guys, this is incredible. Look what it can do. Let's use it. And then also, let's ensure that our students know that copying from AI is plagiarism. I think that some students maybe don't know that. They see this tool, but they are using it. I think um, one of the previous panelists spoke about, are you going to abuse the tool? Then we also need to promote ethical thinking and critical thinking in our students. We need to make our students want to behave ethically. And with a distance university, that is incredibly challenging. We don't have contact with our students, but I think that we need to try. Um, turn it in for postgrad research has now turned it in, has started a new feature that can detect AI. We won't have it at undergrad level yet. I hope soon though, but at postgrad level, we can definitely encourage all of our students to still submit through Turnitin. And then probably the easiest one for all of us to do is to set specialized assignments, set niche assignments. Make your assignments specific to grade nine EMS in an overcrowded South African classroom where learners do not have access to textbooks, because this is the reality for many of us. It will be difficult for ChatGPT to design a lesson plan with all of those specifics in it. Um, also very important is focusing on higher order thinking according to Bloom's. We should be doing that in any case in higher education. We should steer away from the what or the how questions. We should move into critical thinking. And then um, include context into your own assessments. I spoke about that. Also put your own assignment through ChatGPT. I think that it will be really good before you have your meeting with your markers, before I have my meeting with my markers, to put my assignment through ChatGPT. And when I meet with my markers, before we mark to discuss the memo, show them the answer that came up so that they know what to look out for. And um, that is it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Alex, I think all I can say is I am so proud of my team. I am extremely proud of my team. Can we just give them a round of applause? It's honestly not easy standing up here. As I've mentioned, you only just speaking to like a million people. So yeah, I am really, really, really proud of you guys. I don't know what to give you. Flowers. <laughs> Think, think, think. Um, colleagues, not to waste time, I think we're going to skip our moderated discussion and move over to questions and answers. So I'll open the floor for question, uh, questions and answers. Can I have you get the mic and then move around? So yeah, can we ask our panelists questions, please? Oh, yes. Uh, colleagues online, also, you are encouraged to please ask questions. Can you check the chats if there's questions? Yeah. 
any questions in the auditorium? Even just one, colleagues. I know you're intimidated by us. <laughs> There's a question there at the back. <laughs> Good day, my name is Clement from MMC. I have two or three, I'm not sure. The first one is, is AI a friend or an enemy, according to you, panelists? Yes. Number two, uh, with every technological advancement, UNISA has always come up with a strategy in a way. For example, when COVID hit, there was invigilator app. So what is the plan or the strategy to combat assignments and exams which are submitted from sources like chat GPT? And finally, in the next five, 10 years, because I saw now there's a fully functional McDonald's AI in the US, what does our degrees now, will they, uh, are they really diminish or is there a long-term strategy or plan? Thank you. Sure. Okay, um, now I regret saying uh, you're intimidated. <laughs> okay, uh, panelists, I think you've heard the questions. Um, Dr. Nati, we'll start with you. You can choose to respond to any of the questions. And then we'll go to Dr. Photo and then Ms. Christie. Um, thank you for your question. Um, so I'm going to respond to your first question, whether artificial intelligence is an enemy or a friend. Oh, a friend, I mean. A friend, I mean. Oh, okay. But my response is going to be a thesis, and even more philosophical, right? Well, AI is technology, and it's just there. And it's not meant for academics specifically. There are many industries that consume or use AI more than the education sector. There's the financial industry which uses big data. They rely on AI on a daily basis. There's the insurance industry. They rely on AI on the daily basis because of, of, of the amount of data that they are using. There's also other industries, right? Now, when uh, researchers and students uh, analyze that there's this AI, they start exploiting that to their own advantage. But now, to your question of whether it, it is an enemy or a friend. Again, it depends who you are and what ethical standards you set. Yes, it is an enemy in a sense that now I'm I'm getting into the research philosophical research related stuff. It becomes an enemy because for me, it has already assumed a positivist stance that reality is objective, then everything is out there, you just type and it, it retrieves. What about your current feelings? What about connection with who we are as human? Ubuntu. So it becomes an enemy if it will make us lose our understanding of self and the reason for our existence, because it is killing qualitative research, reflection, these are important part of human development. But again, it depends who is using it and what standards we have set. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nati. Uh, Dr. Foto? Okay, thank you. I'll respond to your second question. You ask what can we do uh, with assignments where uh, students use ChatGPT. 
as I said in, in my presentation, our reality has collapsed. Meaning the way we are giving assignments and the way we tell our students to respond to assignments, it doesn't work anymore. We, we talk about um, uh, copy links where we can take the assignment and put it and then we can detect whether or oh, this thing it was written by AI or by human. But as we speak, there's another AI that can overrun copy links. So AI is getting better. We, we won't run away from it. So now, if we are teaching our kids the way we are taught and school friends, let's just forget it. We are not getting anywhere. For example, the CEO of OpenAI spoke this week, Monday, and said we should wait as citizens. There is a feature that is coming for ChatGPT 4. It's going to break the internet. What does that mean? We don't know. So AI is getting smarter. So what I say is that let's change the way we teach our students. Don't ask me how. Thank you. <laughs> Christy. Thank you. Um, your final question, I was hoping that one of the panelists would address it. Um, I think that perhaps AI, while it is taking away a lot of jobs, it will also be creating a lot of jobs. So uh, I don't know much about the field, but I do believe that it could potentially create jobs too. Okay, we have um, one of our our own supporting. I just wanted to add to that um, last question. Um, there's this saying that says um, technology will not replace a human being. But those who know how to use technology will replace those who can't. Yes. So we need to take that into consideration that as much as it's here to stay with us, then those who can't use technology or cannot accept the existence of GPT and of all ARs, those are the people that will be replaced by those who can. Thank you. Yo, guys, we didn't buy our degrees. Yes, yo, ha, ha. we are Leonard. Um, Can I take one last question from Bakang? We are running out of time. Okay, we've got one question there at the top of Pimelo. And then we have... We'll take one and then one, and then we close it off, colleagues. We're running out of time. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sis. No, I'm just concerned with one thing. Yes, we talk about AI. One would agree that when we talk about AI, especially in our town, we talk about the 5G, the fifth um, um, uh, uh, GPT. Now, this is my concern. Is our government doing enough to equip our young brothers and sisters in schools to be able to adapt and and perform adequately and efficiently in the world of AI. Because the truth of the matter is, yes, we talk about what you're talking about now, how the, the, assessment, the assignments are copied by the students using the advantage of AI. But again, it goes back to what you said and uh, presented there that there are those schools which are in a disadvantaged areas, which of course cannot do the fundraising and try to adapt to the, to the predicament. Now, this is my question. What are we doing as the young academics to try and, 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 and provoke the government or rather to force the government to consider those who are coming because the future does not accommodate them. It's very, it's very foreign to whatever they are learning. They're busy learning about all the needs and the ones there, and the AI is saying something else. So I think we, we need to also not only um, take it low, but also try and and, and write and right papers. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Pamela, for your comment. I will take the next question, and there's another question that was raised this side. Okay. Thank you, uh, panelist. Um, first, let me add to your uh, presentations by saying that uh, there's a need for us to actually teach our students the proper way to use AI tools, especially for uh, assignment writing or essay writing or for research purposes. For example, if you add ChatGPT to give you uh, specific uh, sources, on an information, then you find out that ChatGPT will just make up non-existent references 
those things are fake. They are not existing. Then another thing is, if a student is so clever, so smart to the extent that he does not even hide it in the assignment that he's submitting to us, he does not hide the fact that he has engaged a high school in solving the assignment by citing uh, or by referencing uh, ChatGPT, for instance. Then what should be our reaction to such uh, how, do we, how do we go about assessing such a student's assignment? Should we, uh, should we be open enough to accept the fact that this student is clever and also honest by declaring that he has used ChatGPT in writing the assignment and referencing it properly? I think uh, we should begin to engage on this, uh, you know, on this too. So, because we, we don't have to close our minds to those uh, interesting parts of AI tools, you know, helping us. For example, when there's something we call a, block, a writer's block. So, so it might be only the conclusion of a paper you want to write and for one or two weeks, you couldn't even know to conclude the paper. Now, there's, there's a way strategy can even help, help you suggest what to write. And from there, you pick it up. You don't have to copy word for word. Just get an insight and move on with the paper and conclude it. So I think to some extent, the important, uh, uh, the important capabilities that ChatGPT has as, as a tool, as a technology tool, you know, helping us to do our work faster and more efficiently is something that we should engage our students with and not to discourage them from using it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, speaking of uh, fake publications, uh, Chad GPT actually published me two weeks ago in, theo in a theological journal in my maiden name, even not that. Can we get the last question that side and then we close off? Thank you. Um, mine is not really a question, but uh, it's an addition. Um, AI in some other sectors, um, let me open a bit, in agricultural sectors, it really um, decreases uh, job opportunities. Take, for instance, there's a farmer that I know in Sweden. He runs around uh, a 1,000 of dairy cattle. It's him and his wife. But before, you would have 150 employees. But because of the technology, now the 150 employees, they've lost their job. So now, is, 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 is AI is going to be here? Mm -hmm. Now, coming back to the doctor up there, that what is the government doing? Um, helping our young ones that are coming after us. How are we able to equip them? So they are able to, to get job opportunities where, within the space of, of AI. And again, as, as, as researchers, yes, now it's very easy to write an article. It's very easy to, 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 to or, or maybe I can say it's very easy because now people just say cut and paste to do some of the things, which now it becomes an enemy. And also it limits also the, 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 the intelligence of a person because now you are depending. On, on, on Google Scholar, we are depending on, on, on Google. We are just researching on Google. But now it's, uh, people sometimes they find it difficult to get in the library and search a book, sit down, make notes from there. They say, no, why not uh, would I take uh, this information, put it on Google, and then it will do my assignment or everything. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, that's true. Um, colleagues, as I've said, we're running out of time. So our next item on the agenda is uh, with Dr. Masibe, who will be doing the commentary on the presentations that we had today. Over to you, Doc.
Uh, good afternoon, colleagues, um, program director, uh, all protocol observed. Uh, colleagues, mine is to provide a commentary and what I'm going to try and do is move as quickly as possible. I mean, many of the, many of the things um, have already been uh, said by the panelists here. Um, and I would like to mention that my focus would be a reflection, of course, and commentary on what has already been presented, but I also worked on a PowerPoint presentation with some of my um, thinking into the future, uh, in, in, into the future of AI on teaching uh, and learning as well as um, research. Uh, if you look at the following, I, I selected this diagram carefully because um, I, I believe that, like it has been said that AI has benefits, even though it also has challenges. But for me, we need to use these these uh, tools. We, we we can't just uh, ignore AI. It is here to stay, and uh, our best bet is to use it to our advantage. Okay, so uh, we we'll just have present a commentary on um, my reflection, also incorporating what has been said already in terms of the future of AI and research and uh, in teaching and learning. Um, okay, so here I was just talking about um, my own reflection of what is currently being done, and it it, it corresponds with uh, many of the items that have already been uh, shared by the um, panelists. And I was just looking at the use of AI into teaching, uh, zooming into lesson planning. How does how can it uh, assist us? I mean, uh, the entire uh, discussion. Uh, or yeah, that has been shared by the panelists, touched on the benefits. And I see some benefits of AI into uh, lesson planning. I'm just thinking if you consider teachers that are not academics, that don't do uh, research, would probably struggle to find out what to learn a struggle with before when they plan for instruction. But through AI, they can try and find out what to learn a struggle with, and that can shape their planning and their teaching. And we have what we call uh, virtual and uh, augmented realities that uh, 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 basically try to recreate real life situation, which is a teaching and learning activity that we, we should use to help our learners understand concepts um, and uh, assessment. It saves us time. I mean, that is the whole point of development and technologies to try and solve our problems. So the problems that we have, we have a, a, a huge workload, we have to mark a lot of uh, scripts and so on, we can't do it, but if we have tools that can assist us with these things, why not? Why not? We should we should use them, you know? Um, and then I also basically thought about, um, and listening to what has been said, of course, uh, the use of AI in research. I'm gonna be honest with you. I use chat GPT to give me a structure. And I think we should encourage, we can't, uh, we can't try by all means to catch our students. I mean, uh, another panelist was talking about uh, the issue of integrity and that I did not introduce uh, challenges with integrity. Uh, we've always had issues. I mean, so what we must do is we should, I would encourage my students to use um, AI to help them with personalized learning. I use it myself to learn. I work, you know, uh, I work at UNISA and when I joined, I had to work with assessments that were not designed by me. That's how it works, right? Because we create our uh, assessments a year earlier. And if someone joins an institution uh, where the assessments have already been designed, now they have to mark it. And now you have to think, how was the previous uh, lecturer thinking when they uh, formulated this question? And if you struggle, you can you can consult with AI. AI should be there for consultations. That's my commentary. That's what I can say. It should be there. It sh it should be there for consultation. You shouldn't take everything that you get from uh, there. So we should use it for teaching and learning. Use it for research. Uh, if you tell ChatGPT, please write me a research proposal on disabled writer, a research proposal briefly. No references from what I've seen so far. Nothing. But it gives you a structure from there then you can you can work from you don't take everything and then you submit you send it to your supervisor or something like that or send it to it no to nrf when you're applying for grants no come on uh, but you use it <laughs> but yes it's 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 a tool that is meant to assist us so i will shoot straight into 
future prospects. And you know, I, I reviewed literature here when I was given two weeks. I must, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for two long weeks, I've reviewed literature to try and find out what do scholars who work in AI say about the, the future. And I also asked ChatGPT, and the craziest thing is researchers, humans speculate that uh, AI will eventually be capable of, uh, of carrying out instructions without teachers. So they basically speculate that it can carry out classroom instruction. I mean, Dr. Foto also mentioned uh, some scary thoughts and statistics and speculations about uh, what the future holds. And um, AI tells you that, you know, uh, technology wouldn't replace us. And for me, I I should agree with AI. I, I don't think it should, it should replace us. I mean, there was a question whether AI is, is, is going to take our jobs. And then there was a, an answer to that, uh, that, you know what, uh, those who do not adapt, of course, those who do not adapt, those are the ones who would be in trouble. Uh, I, 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 I indicated in my uh, concluding remarks there that, uh, you know what, the uh, Darwin's theory of natural selection has never been more relevant. I think that for me captures what we should do with the AI tools that we have. Those who want to be selected naturally will do whatever it takes, but those that don't want to be selected naturally, they will, they will not do anything. They will just let the AI do the thing for them. And that is what will create uh, the problems that we have. So um, yeah, that's basically my story in terms of what I see as um, the, AI in, um, in terms of uh, teaching and learning, uh, arguing that we should use the tool. It helps a lot if you want to generate big data, analyze big data, it is there to help, to assess big um, classes and so on, help you with assessments, it, it, is, it, is, it is there to help. So colleagues, mine was to give a commentary and I focused more on the positives I mean, the, the, the negatives have already been addressed. <laughs> to be fair, the negatives have been addressed. The scary thoughts and scary parts and monsters. The, the monsters, I mean, there were graphics uh, on, on, uh, projected on the screen. So I tried to focus on the positives. I mean, on a lighter note, let's, let's, let's use the technology that is here to reduce human effort. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mazibe. Um, uh, you mentioned that ChatGPT does not provide references. It depends how you feed ChatGPT. So you write, ChatGPT, write me an abstract or an article with references in text and reference list according to the APA style it will give you. Alice. Anyway, um, that brings us to the end of our program for the second session. Um, colleagues, I just want to take this time to just say thank you for allowing us this space to cement ourselves. It's, all, uh, it's truly been an honor for us to be here. It's a privilege. We don't take this opportunity for granted. Um, thank you so much for your time. You could have been at home but you decided to be here with us. Um, yeah, so I'm going to hand over to our MC for the day. And yeah, thank you so much, colleagues. One thing that has been demonstrated throughout this day is the force that is the Young Academic Research Interest Group. We have come with a mandate to serve academia, to serve brilliance, to serve a spirit of excellence and confidence. So it's been an honor and a privilege to be your program director throughout this day. As we are coming to close, I have one announcement. Tomorrow's session for the SEDU Research and Innovation Week will be fully online. 
There is a link that has been provided and it is in, in most of our calendars for tomorrow morning and the sessions will be beginning at nine o'clock in the morning and it is fully online. So don't get dressed and come here. You won't find anyone. <laughs> so we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Another announcement that we have is that at the end of closure today, please can everybody remain behind so that we can come to the front and take a group picture to just commemorate the day that was and all of us being here. And from me, I think the most important thing that has stood out is that we are no longer fixating on the opportunity to network with the hierarchies that have been inherited but now we are learning how to network across and using the people that are on our level, below our level, as well as above us. So it's going to be an exciting ride for all of us young academics here in the College of Education. And in closing, we have Mrs. Aisha Karim from the Department of Early Childhood Education, and she's going to do our closing. Thank you. Okay, so I'm so honored today to give the closing remarks for today's session. Um, we got to officially launch our um, said you Young Academic Interest Research Group, uh, which was something so amazing. I'm so inspired by all our academics. Uh, as a PhD student myself, uh, you know, I got the supportive uh, environment, community uh, that I can go to. I mean, just yesterday we had a supportive um, writing um, you know, workshop where I was able to, um, you know, give uh, us basically um, for some assistance just with my writing in general, with my literature review. Uh, so it's such a nice um, a support group that we have. And I'm so um, thankful to Professor Gaza and uh, the executive members as well as our CODs for giving us this opportunity. And also I want to um, thank all our speakers today. Um, I really um, am so inspired by all the presentations. Uh, we really learned a lot today and I'm inspired to write an article myself with this I, uh, AI that we uh, we learned about today. Um, I'm also not very um, familiar with that until today. I didn't even know what, the, what was this chat GPT. <laughs> Yes, I didn't even know what that was until today. So I, I was trying to <laughs> uh, download that app. Okay, but I won't use it. And um, yes, yeah, so I just wanted to thank everyone for today. It was really inspiring. And um, I hope that next time I would be able to also present something interesting and be part of this panel discussion. Thank you. Yeah, we can.